This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganus Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas of the Indian Civil Service LibriVox, Volume 1 Preface, recorded by Maria Celano The Santals are a Munda tribe, a branch of that aboriginal element which probably entered India from the northeast. At the present day they inhabit the eastern outskirts of the Chutia Nag Pura Plateau. Originally hunters and dwellers in the jungle, they are still but indifferent agriculturists. Like the Mundas and Hoes and other representatives of the race, they are jovial in character, fond of their rice beer, and ready to take a joke. Their social organization is very complete. Each village has its headman or manji with his assistant, the Paranik. The Jagmangi is charged with the supervision of the morals of the young men and women. The Naeka is the village priest. The Godet is the village constable. Over a group of villages is the Pargana, or tribal chief. The Santals are divided into exogamous septs, originally twelve in number, and their social observances are complex, e.g. while some relations treat each other with the greatest reserve, between others the utmost freedom of intercourse is allowed. Their religion is animistic. Spirits, fangas, are everywhere around them. The spirits of their ancestors, the spirit of the house, the spirit dwelling in the patch of primeval forest preserved in each village, every hill, tree, and rock may have its spirit. These spirits are propitiated by elaborate ceremonies and sacrifices, which generally terminate in dances and the drinking of rice beer. The Santal Parganas is a district 4,800 square miles in area lying about 150 miles north of Calcutta, and was formed into a separate administration after the Santals had risen in rebellion in 1856. The Santals at present form about one-third of the population. The stories and legends which are here translated have been collected by the Reverend O. Bodding, D.D., of the Scandinavian mission to the Santals. To be perfectly sure that neither language nor ideas should in any way be influenced by contact with a European mind, he arranged for most of them to be written out in Santali, principally by a Christian convert named Sagram Murmu, at present living at Mahul Pahari in the Santal Parganas. Santali is an agglutinative language with great regularity and complexity, but when the Santals come in contact with races speaking an Aryan language, it is apt to become corrupted with foreign idioms. The language in which these stories has been written is beautifully pure, and the purity of language may be accepted as an index that the ideas have not been affected, as is often the case, by contact with Europeans. My translation, though somewhat condensed, is very literal, and the stories have perhaps thereby an added interest as showing the way in which a very primitive people look at things. The Santals are great storytellers. The old folk of the village gather the young people round them in the evening and tell them stories, and the men, when watching the crops on the threshing floor, will often sit up all night telling stories. There is, however, no doubt that at the present time the knowledge of these stories tends to die out. Under the peace which British rule brings, there is more intercourse between the different communities and castes. A considerable degree of assimilation takes place, and old customs and traditions tend to be obliterated. Several collections of Indian stories have been made. E.G. Stokes' 
Indian Fairy Tales, Freer Old Dekan Days, Day Folk Tales of Bengal, and Knowles Folk Tales of Kashmir. And it will be seen that all the stories in the present collection are by no means of pure Santal origin. Incidents which form part of the common stock of Indian folklore abound, and many of the stories professedly relate to characters of various Hindu castes. Others, again, deal with such essentially Santal beliefs as the dealings of men and bangas. The Reverend Dr. Campbell of Gobind Pora published in 1891 a collection of Santal folk tales. He gathered his materials in the district of Mangbam, and many of the stories are identical with those included in the present volume. I have added as an appendix some stories which I have collected among the Hoes of Singbam, a tribe closely related to the Santals, and which the Asian Society of Bengal has kindly permitted me to reprint here. My task has been merely one of translation. It is due solely to Mr. Bodding's influence with and intimate knowledge of the people that the stories have been committed to writing, and I have to thank him for assistance and advice throughout my work of translation. I have roughly classified the stories. In Part 1 are stories of a general character. Part 2, stories relating to animals. In Part 3, stories which are scarcely folklore but are anecdotes relating to Santal life. In Part 4, stories relating to the dealings of bangas and men. In Part 5 are some legends and traditions, and a few notes relating to tribal customs. Part 6 contains illustrations of the belief in witchcraft. I have had to omit a certain number of stories as unsuited for publication. C. H. Bompas End of Preface This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganas Translated by Cecil Henry Bampas Part 1 Number 1 Bajun and Johor Recorded by West Winds 12 Once upon a time there were two brothers, named Bajun and Johor. Bajun was married, and one day his wife fell ill of fever. So, as he was going ploughing, Bajun told Johor to stay at home and cook the dinner, and he bade him put into the pot three measures of rice. Johor stayed at home and filled the pot with water and put it on to boil. Then he went to look for rice measures. There was only one in the house, and Johor thought, my brother told me to put in three measures, and if I only put in one, I shall get into trouble. So he went to the neighbor's house and borrowed two more measures, and put them into the pot and left them to boil. At noon, Bajun came back from ploughing and found Johor stirring the pot and asked him whether the rice was ready. Johor made no answer, so Bajun took the spoon from him, saying, Let me feel how it is getting on. But when he stirred with the spoon, he heard a rattling noise, and when he looked into the pot, he found no rice, but only three wooden measures floating about. Then he turned and abused Jehor for his folly, but Jehor said, You yourself told me to put in three measures, and I have done so. So Bajun had to set to work and cook the rice himself, and got his dinner very late. Next day, Bajun said to Jehor, you don't know how to cook the dinner. I will stay at home today. You go to plough, and take a hatchet with you, and if the plough catches in a root or anything, give a cut with the hatchet. So Jehor went ploughing, and when the plough caught in anything and stopped, he gave a cut with his hatchet at the legs of the bullocks. They backed and plunged with the pain, and then he only chopped at them the more until he lamed them both. 
At noon, Bajun saw the bullocks come limping back and asked what was the matter with them. Oh, said Jahor, that is because I cut at them, as you told me. You idiot, said Bajun, I meant you to give a cut at the roots in which the plough got caught, not the legs of the bullocks. How will you live if you do such silly things? You cannot plough, so you must stay at home and cook the rice. I will show you this evening how it is done. So after that Jahor stayed at home and cooked. Bajun's wife grew no better. So one day Bajun, before he went to the fields, told Jahor to warm some water in order that his wife might wash with it. But Jahor made the water boiling hot, and then took it and began to pour it over his sister-in-law as she lay in her bed. She was scalded and shrieked out, Don't pour it over me! But Jahor only laughed and went on pouring until he had scalded her to death. Then he wrapped her up in a cloth and brought her dinner to her and offered it to her to eat, but she was dead and made no answer to him, so he left it by her and went and ate his own rice. When Bajun came back and found his wife scalded to death, he was very angry and went to get an axe to kill Jahor with. Whereupon Jahor ran away into the jungle and Bajun pursued him with the axe. In the jungle Jahor found a dead sheep, and he took out its stomach and called out, Where are you, brother? I have found some meat. But Bajun answered, I will not leave you till I have killed you. So Jahor ran on and climbed up inside a hollow tree, where Bajun could not follow. Bajun got a long stick and poked at him with it, and as he poked, Jahor let fall the sheep's stomach. And when Bajun saw it, he concluded that he had killed his brother. So he went home and burned the body of his wife, and a few days later he performed the funeral ceremonies to the memory of his wife and brother. He smeared the floor of the house with cow dung and sacrificed goats and fowl. Now Jahor had come back that day and climbed up on to the rafters of the house, and he sat there watching all that his brother did. Bajun cooked a great basket of rice, and stewed the flesh of the animals he had sacrificed, and offered it to the spirits of the dead, and he recited the dedication, My wife, I offer this rice, this food, for your purification. And, so saying, he scattered some rice on the ground, and he also offered to Jahor, saying, Jahor, my brother, I offer this rice, this food, for your purification. And then Jahor called out from the roof, Well, as you offer it to me, I will take it. Bajun had not bargained to get any answer, so he was astounded and went to ask the villagers whether their spirits made answer when sacrificed to. And the villagers told him that they had never heard of such a thing. While Bajun was away on this errand, Jahor took up the unguarded basket of rice and ran away with it. After going some way, he sat down by the road and ate as much as he wanted. Then he sat and called out, Is there anyone on the road or in the jungle who wants a feast? A gang of thieves, who were on a thieving expedition, heard him and went to see what he meant. He offered to let them eat the rice if they would admit him to their company. They agreed, and he went on with them to steal. They broke into a rich man's house, and the thieves began to collect the pots and pans. But Jahor felt about in the dark, and got hold of a drum, and began to beat on it. This woke up the people of the house, and they drove away the thieves. Then the thieves abused Jahor, and said that they could not let him stay with them. Very well, said he, then give me back the rice you ate. Of course they could not do this, so they had to let him stay with them. Then they went to the house of a rich Hindu who had a stable full of horses, and they planned to steal the horses and ride away with them. So each thief picked out a horse, but Jahor got hold of a tiger which had come to the back of the stable to kill one of the horses. And when the thieves mounted their horses, Jahor mounted on the tiger, and the tiger ran off with him towards the jungle.
Jehor kept on calling out, Keep to the road, you Hindu horse! Keep to the road, you Hindu horse! But it dragged him through the briars and bushes till he was dead, and that was the end of Jehor. End of Bajun and Jehor This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganas. Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas. Part 1. Number 2. Anua and His Mother. Read by West Winds 12. Once there was a young fellow named Anua who lived with his old mother, and when he was out ploughing, his mother used to take him his breakfast. One day a jackal met her on her way to the field with her son's breakfast, and told her to put down the food which she was carrying, or he would knock her down and bite her. So she put it down in a fright, and the jackal ate most of it, and then went away. And the old woman took what was left to her son, and told him nothing about what had happened. This happened several days in succession. At last, one day, Anua asked her why she brought so little rice, and that so untidily arranged. So she told him how she was attacked every day by the jackal. Then they made a plan that the next day the mother should take the plough afield, while Anua should dress up as an old woman and carry the breakfast. This they did, and the jackal met Anua, as usual, and made him put down the breakfast basket. But while the jackal was eating, Anua knocked him head over heels with his stick, and the jackal got up and fled, threatening and cursing Anua. Among other things, the jackal, as he ran away, had threatened to eat Anua's malhan plants. So Anua put a fence of thorns around them, and when the jackal came at night and tried to eat the pods, he only got his nose pricked. Foiled in this, the jackal called out, Well, I will eat your fowls to-morrow. But Anua, the next night, sat by the fowl house with a sickle, and when the jackal came and poked his head in, Anua gave him a rap on the snout with the sickle. So the jackal made off, crying, Well, Anua, your fowls have pecked me on the head. You shall die. So the next day, Anua pretended to be dead, and his mother went about crying. She took her way to the jungle, and there she met the jackal, and she told him that Anua had died in consequence of his curse, and she invited him to the funeral feast, saying that he used to eat the rice which she had cooked, and he had become like a son to her. The jackal gladly promised to attend, and he collected a number of his friends, and at evening they went to Anua's house and sat down in the courtyard. Then the old woman came out and began to bewail her son, but the jackal said, Stop crying, Granny. You cannot get back the dead. Let us get on to the feast. So she said that she would fry some cakes first, as it would take some time before the rice was ready. The jackals approved of this, but they asked her to tie them up with a rope first, lest they should get to fighting over the food. So the old woman brought a thick rope and tied them all up, and tightest of all she tied up the jackal, which had cursed Anua. Then she went inside and put an iron pan on the fire, and from time to time she sprinkled water on it, and when the jackals heard the water hissing, they thought that it was the cakes frying, and jumped about with joy. Suddenly Anua came out with a thick stick and set it to beating the jackals, till they bit through the ropes and ran away howling. But the first jackal was tied so tightly that he could not escape, and Anua beat him till he was senseless, and lay without moving all night. The next morning Anua took the jackal and tied him to a stake near the place where the village women drew water, and he put a thick stick beside it, and every woman who went for water would give the jackal one blow with the stick. After a few days' beating, the body of the jackal became all swollen, and one night some other jackals came there and asked him what he ate that he had got so fat, and he said that every one who came to draw water gave him a handful of rice, and that that was why he was so fat, and if they did not believe him, they could take his place and try for themselves. 
So one jackal agreed to try, and untied the first jackal, and let himself be tied in his place. But in the morning five women came down, and each gave him a blow with the stick, till he jumped about for pain. And seeing him jumping, other women came and beat him till he died. End of Anua and His Mother This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Paraganas. Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas. Part 1. Number 3. Leda and the Leopard. Read by West Winds Twelve. Once upon a time, a boy named Leda was tending cattle with other boys at the foot of a hill. These boys, in fun, used to call out, Ho, leopard! Ho, leopard! And the echo used to answer from the hill, Ho, leopard! Now there really was a leopard who lived in the hill, and one day he was playing hide-and-seek with a lizard, which also lived there. The lizard hid, and the leopard looked everywhere for it in vain. At last the leopard sat down to rest, and it chanced that he sat right on top of the lizard, which was hiding in a hole. The lizard thought that the leopard meant to hurt it, and in revenge bit him, and fastened on to his rump so that he could not get it off. So that day, when the boys came calling out, Ho, leopard! He ran towards them to get their help, but when they saw the leopard, they all fled for their lives. Leda, however, could not run fast because he was lame, and the leopard headed him off and begged him to remove the lizard. This he did after the leopard had sworn not to eat him, and before they parted the leopard made him promise to tell no one that the lizard had bitten him, and said that if he told, then he would be carried off and eaten. So Leda rejoined his companions and told them nothing of what had passed between him and the leopard. But that night, when they had all gone to bed, Leda's sister-in-law began to worry him, to tell her what the leopard had said to him when it had caught him. He told her that the leopard would eat him if he told. But she coaxed him and said that no one could hear them inside the house. So at last he told her that he had taken off a lizard which was hanging on to its rump. Then they went to sleep. But the leopard was hiding in the back of the house, and heard all that they said. And when they were all asleep, he crept in and carried off Leda's bed, with Leda in it, on his head. When Leda woke up towards morning, he found himself being carried through dense jungle, and he quietly pulled himself up into one of the trees which overhung the path. Thus, when the leopard put down the bed, and was going to eat Leda, he found it empty. So he went back on his track, and by and by came to the tree in which Leda was hiding. The leopard begged Leda to come down, as he had something to say to him, and promised not to eat him. But directly Leda reached the ground, the leopard said, Now I am going to eat you. Leda was powerless, so he only asked to be allowed to have one chew of tobacco before he died. The leopard assented, and Leda felt in his cloth for his tobacco. But the tobacco did not come out easily, and as Leda felt about for it the dried tobacco leaves crackled. The leopard asked what the crackling sound was, and Leda said, That is the lizard which bit you yesterday. Then the leopard got into a terrible fright, and ran away as hard as he could, calling out, Don't let it loose! Don't let it loose! So Leda was saved from the leopard, but he did not know his way out of the jungle. He wandered about, till he came to the place where the wild buffalo used to sleep at night, and he swept up the place and made it clean, and then took refuge in a hollow tree. He stayed there some days, sweeping up the place daily and supporting himself on the fruit of a fig tree. At last, one day, the buffaloes left one cow behind to watch and see who it was who swept up their sleeping place. 
the cow pretended to be too ill to rise, and Leda, after watching for some time, came out and swept the ground as usual, and then tried to pull the sick cow up by the tail. But she would not move, so he went back to his hollow tree. When the buffaloes returned, they heard that it was a kind-hearted man who cleaned their sleeping place. So they called Leda out and said that they would keep him as their servant to clean their sleeping place and to scrub them when they bathed in the river. They made him taste the milk of all the cows and appointed the cow, whose milk he liked the best, to supply him. Henceforward he used to wander about with the buffalo, and he made a flute and used to play on it. One day, after scrubbing the buffaloes, he washed his head in the river, and some of his hairs came out. So he wrapped them up in a leaf, and set the packet to float down the stream. Lower down the stream, two princesses were bathing with their attendants, and when they saw the packet, they tried. Who could fish it out? And it was the younger princess who caught it. Then they measured the hairs and found them twelve cubits long. The princess who had taken the packet from the water went home and took to her bed, and said that she would not eat until the man was found to whom the hairs belonged. Her father, the Raja, sent messengers in all directions to search for the man, but they could not find him. Then he sent a parrot and the parrot flew up high, and looking down saw Leda with the buffaloes in the forest, but it did not dare to go near. So the parrot returned, and told the Raja that the man was in the forest, but that no messenger could approach for fear of the wild buffaloes. However, a crow said, I can bring him if any one can. So they sent the crow, and it went and perched on the backs of the buffaloes, and began to peck them. Then Leda threw stones at it, but it would not go away. Then he threw a stick at it, and last of all he threw his flute. The crow caught up the flute and flew up to a tree with it. Leda ran after it, but the crow kept flying on a short distance, and Leda still pursued until he came to the Raja's city. The crow flew on until it entered the room where the princess lay and dropped the flute into the hands of the princess. Leda followed right into the room, and they shut him in, and the princess gave him his flute after he had promised to marry her. So he stayed there a long time, but meanwhile the buffaloes all got weak and ill for want of someone to look after them. One day Leda set off to the jungle with his wife to see them, and when he saw how ill the buffaloes were, he decided to build a house in the jungle and live there. And the Raja sent them money and horses and cattle and elephants and servants, and they built a palace. And Leda subdued all the jungle and became a great Raja. And he made a highway to his father-in-law's home and used to go to and fro on it. End of Leda and the Leopard This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganus, translated by Cecil Henry Bompas, Part One, Four, The Cruel Stepmother, recorded by Victoria Grace. There was once a Raja whose wife died, leaving him with one young child. He reared it with great care, and when it could toddle about, it took a great fancy to a cat. The child was always playing with it and carrying it about. All his friends begged the Raja to marry again, but he said that he was sure that a stepmother would be cruel to his child. At last they persuaded him to promise to marry again, if a bride could be found who would promise to care for the child as her own. So his friends looked out for a bride. But though they found plenty of girls who were anxious to marry the Raja, not one would promise to care for his child as her own. There was a young widow in a certain village who heard of what was going on, and one day she asked whether a bride had been found for the Raja, and she was told that no one was willing to take charge of the child. 
Why don't they agree? said she. I would agree, fast enough. If I were Rani, I should have nothing to do but look after the child, and I would care for it more than its own mother could. This came to the ears of the Raja, and he sent for the widow and was pleased with her looks. And when she promised to love his child as her own, he married her. At first, no one could be kinder to the child than she was. But in the course of time, she had a child of her own, and then she began to be jealous of the elder child, and she thought daily how she could get rid of him. He was still devoted to his cat, and one day, when he came back to the house, he asked his stepmother where the cat was. She answered angrily, "'The cat has bewitched the boy. It is cat, cat, all day long!' At this the child began to cry, so she found the cat and threw it to him, saying, "'Here is your cat. You are mad about your cat!' But the boy hugged it in his arms and kept on crying at his stepmother's cross words. As he would not keep quiet, his stepmother got more angry still, and catching hold of the cat, she scratched her own arms and legs with the cat's claws until the blood flowed. Then she began to cry and scold, and when the neighbors came to see what was the matter, she told them that the boy had let his cat scratch her, and the neighbors saw that she was not loving the boy as she promised. Presently the Rajah came in and asked what was the matter. She turned and scolded him, saying, "'You have reared the accursed cat, and it has scratched me finely. Look, it has taken all the skin off. This is the way the boy repays me for all my trouble. I will not stay with you. If I stay, the boy will injure me like this again.' The Rajah said, "'Don't cry like a baby. How can a simple child like that know better? When he grows up, I will scold him.' But the woman persisted, and declared that she would go away with her own child unless the Rajah promised to kill his elder son. The Rajah refused to do this, so the Rani took up her baby and went out of the house with it in a rage. Now the Rajah was deeply in love with her, and he followed and stopped her, and said that he could not let her take away his younger child. She answered, "'Why trouble about the child? It is mine. I have left you your boy. If you don't kill him, when he grows up, he will tell you some lie about me, and make you have me beaten to death." At last the Rajah said, "'Well, come back, and if the boy does you any harm, I will kill him.' But the Rani said, "'Either kill him now, or let me go.' So at last the Rajah promised, and brought her back to the palace. Then the Rajah called the boy, and gave him his dinner, and told him that they were going on a visit to his uncle's, and the child was delighted, and fetched his shoes and umbrella, and off they set and a dog came running after them. When they came to a jungle, the Raja told his son to sit under a tree and wait for him, and he went away and killed the dog that had followed them, and smeared the blood on his axe, and went home, leaving the child. When his father did not return, the child began to cry, and Thakur heard him and came down, and to frighten the boy and make him leave the jungle, he came in the guise of a leopard, but the child would not move from where he was. Then Thakur appeared as a bear, and as a snake, and an elephant, and in many other forms, but the child would not move. So at last Thakur took the form of an old woman, who lifted him in her arms and soothed him, and carried him to the edge of the jungle, and left him on the outskirts of a village. In the morning a rich Brahmin found him and took him home, and as no one claimed the child, he brought him up and made him his goat herd, and they gave him the name of Leela. The Brahmin's sons and daughters used to go to school, and before he took his goats out to graze, Leela used to carry their books to the school. And going to the school every day, Leela got to know one or two letters, and used to draw them in the sand while minding his goats. Later he got the children to give him an old book, saying that he wanted to pretend to the other boys that he could read, and out of this book he taught himself to read. And as he grew up he became quite a scholar. One day he picked up a letter and found that it was from one of the village girls, arranging to elope that very evening with a young man. At the appointed time, Leela went to the rendezvous and hid himself in a tree. Soon he saw the Brahmin's daughter come to the place, but as her letter had not been delivered, her lover did not appear. The girl got tired of waiting, and then she began to call to her lover, thinking that perhaps he was hiding for a joke. When she called, Leela answered from the tree, and she thought that it was her lover, and said, "'Come down, and let us be off.' So Leela came down, and they started off together. When day dawned, she saw that it was Leela who was with her, and she sat down and upbraided him for deceiving her. Leela said that they had met by chance. He had not enticed her away. No harm had been done, and she could go home if she liked, or come away with him if she liked. The girl considered, but she saw that if she went home now, she would be disgraced, and her family would be outcasted. 
so in the end she agreed to run away with Leela. They went on, and after traveling some days, they came to a great city, where they took up their quarters in a tumble-down house, and the next morning Leela went into the city to look for work. He went to the country and enrolled himself as a muktir, attorney, and soon the litigants and the magistrates found out how clever he was, and he acquired a big practice. One day the Rajah said, This fellow is very handsome. I wonder what his wife is like. And he sent an old woman to see. So the old woman went and got into conversation with Leela's wife, and returned to the Rajah, and told him that none of his wives was so beautiful as Leela's wife. So the Rajah determined to go and see her himself. And as the old woman said that she would hide herself in the house if she saw the Rajah coming, he disguised himself as a poor man and went and saw her. He found that the old woman had not exaggerated, and he determined to possess himself of Leela's wife. He had first to get Leela out of the way. So he sent for him and said, You are a fine fellow, and have given me satisfaction. I have one more commission for you. If you perform it, I will give you half my kingdom and my sister in marriage. Leela said that he must hear what it was before he made any promise. The Rajah said, It is this. In a certain mountain grows the Chanmoni Kusum flower. Bring it to me, and I will give you what I have promised. But the Rajah felt sure that if Leela went to the mountain, he would be eaten by the Rakas, ogres who dwelt there. Leela said that he would go if the Rajah gave him a written bond in the presence of witnesses, and this the Rajah willingly did. Then Leela went and told his wife, and she said, This is excellent. I have a younger sister in the mountain. Her name is Chanmoni, and it was she who planted the Chanmoni Kusum flower. When you get there, call her by her name, and she will certainly give you the flower. So Leela started off, and when he was gone his wife fell ill, and her body became a mass of sores. Directly, Leela was out of the way. The Rajah sent the old woman to see what his wife was doing, and she brought back word that she was afflicted with illness. So the Rajah sent medicines, and told the old woman to nurse her. Leela went off, and came to the cave in the mountain where Chanmoni lived with the Rakas, and the Rakas was away hunting men. So Leela called out Chanmoni, and told her who he was, and begged her to hide him. Then they planned how they should kill the Rakas, and she hid him in the cave. Presently the Rakas returned, and said to Chanmoni, I smell a man. Where is he? But Chanmoni said that there was no one there but herself, and that the smell was probably due to the Rakas having been eating human flesh, and recommended her to anoint herself with hot ghee. The Rakas agreed. So Chanmoni put a great iron pan of ghee on to boil, and when it was boiling, she called the Rakas, and as the Rakas was leaning over the pan, Leela ran out and pushed her into the boiling ghee, and she died. Then Chanmoni asked Leela why he had come, and he told her, To fetch the flower. She promised to give it to him, but asked what was to become of her now that the ogress with whom she lived was dead. Leela promised to take her with him. So they cut off the tongue and ears and claws of the Rakas, and returned to the city. And directly Leela returned, his first wife recovered from her illness. Then the Rajah saw that it was useless to contend with Leela, and he gave him half his kingdom and married him to his sister according to his bond. So Leela lived with his three Ranis, and they bore him children. And after some years he told them that he was the son of a Rajah, and he wished to visit his own country and see whether his father was alive. So they set out in great style, with horses and elephants and came to the town where Leela's father lived. Now, five or six days after abandoning Leela, his father had become blind, and he made over the management of his kingdom to a Dewan, and the Dewan and the Rani managed everything. When the Dewan heard that Leela had come with a great force, he thought that he would loot the country, and he ran away in fear. Then Leela sent word to his father to come to him, as he was the son who had been abandoned in the jungle. So the Rajah set forth joyfully. And after he had gone a few paces, he began to see dimly, and by the time that he came to Leela's camp, he had quite recovered his eyesight. When they met, father and son embraced and wept over each other, and Leela ordered a feast to be prepared. And while this was being done, a maidservant came running to say that the wicked Ronnie had hanged herself. So they went and burned the body, and then returned and enjoyed the feast. Then the Rajah resigned his kingdom to Leela, and the riots begged him to stay and rule over them. So he remained there, and lived, happily ever after. End of The Cruel Stepmother
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Paragonis Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas Part 1, Number 5 Karmu and Dharmu Recorded by Kirk Thomas, Atlanta, Georgia There were once two brothers, Karmu and Dharmu. Karmu was a farmer, and Dharmu was a trader. Once when Dharmu was away from home, Karmu gave a religious feast and did not invite Dharmu's household. When Dharmu returned and learnt this, he told his wife that he also would perform the ceremonies in his house. So they set to work and were employed in cooking rice and vegetables far into the night. And Karam Gosain came down to see what preparations Dharmu was making in his honor, and he watched from the back of the house. Just then Dharmu strained off the water from the cooked rice and threw it out of the window, and it fell on Karam Gosain and scalded him. And as the flies and insects worried the wound, Karam Gosain went off to the Ganges and buried himself in the middle of the stream. As he had thus offended Karam Gosain, all Dharmu's undertakings failed, and he fell into deep poverty and had not even enough to eat, so he had to take service with his brother Karmu. When the time for transplanting the rice came, Dharmu used to plow and dig the ditches and mend the gaps along with the day laborers. Karmu told him not to work himself but act as overseer of the other laborers, and the laborers also told him that it was not suitable for him to work as a laborer himself. But Dharmu said that he must earn his wages and insisted on working. And in the same way Dharmu's wife might have acted as overseer of the women, but she was ashamed not to work too. One day they were transplanting the rice, and Karmu brought out breakfast for the laborers. He told Dharmu and his wife to wash their hands and come and eat. But they answered that they belonged to the household, and that the hired laborers should be fed first. So the laborers ate, and they ate up all the rice, and there was nothing left for Dharmu and his wife. When the midday meal was brought, the same thing happened. Dharmu and his wife got nothing. But they hoped that it would be made up to them when the wages were paid, and worked on fasting. At evening, when they came to pay the wages in kind, Dharmu's name was called out first, but he told his brother to pay the laborers first, and in doing this the paddy was all used up, and there was nothing left for Dharmu and his wife. So they went home sorrowfully, and their children cried for food, and they had nothing to give them. In the night Dharmu's wife said, They promised to pay us for merely looking after the work, and instead we worked hard and have still got nothing. We will not work for them any more. Come, let us undo the work we did today. You cut down the embankments you repaired, and I will uproot the seedlings which I planted. So they went out into the night to do this. But whenever Dharmu raised his spade, a voice called out, Hold, hold! And whenever his wife put out her hand to pull up the rice, a voice called out, Hold, hold! Then they said, Who are you to stop us? And the voice answered, You have done evil and offended Karam Gosain by scalding him. This is why you have become poor and today have worked without food and without wages. He has gone to the Ganges, and you must go and propitiate him. And they asked how they should propitiate him, and the voice said, Grind turmeric and put it on a plate, and buy new cloth and dye it with turmeric, and make ready oil, and take these things to the Ganges, and call on Karam Gosain. And they believed the voice, and the next day did as it commanded, and set off, leaving their children in charge of Karmu. On the way they came to a fig tree, full of figs, and they went to eat the fruit, but when they got near they found that all the figs were full of grubs, 
and they sang. Exhausted by hunger, we came to a fig tree, and found it full of grubs. O oh, Karam Gosain, how far off are you? Then they came to a mango tree, and the same thing happened. And they went on and saw a cow with a calf, and they thought that they would milk the cow and drink the milk. But when they went to catch it, it ran away from them and would not let itself be caught. And they sang, We go to catch the cow, and it runs away. We go to catch the calf, and it runs away. O oh, Karam Gosain, how far off are you? But the cow said to them, Go to the banks of the Ganges. Then they came to a buffalo and went to milk it, but it lowered its head and charged them. And Dharmu cried, but his wife said, Don't cry, and sang, If you go to catch the buffalo, Dharmu, it will kill you. How shall we drink milk? How shall we drink milk? How far off are you, O oh, our Karam Gosain? And the buffalo said, Go on to the bank of the Ganges. Then they came to a horse, and they thought that they would catch it and mount it. But it kicked and snorted, and they sang, Dharmu tries to catch the horse, but it kicks and runs away. How shall we reach the Ganges? O oh, Karam Gosain, how far off are you? And the horse said, Go to the banks of the Ganges. Then they saw an elephant, but it would not let them approach. So they decided to push on straight for the river. And they saw under a banyan tree a large pot full of rupees, but they were so disheartened that they made no attempt to touch it. Then they met a woman who asked where they were going, and when she heard, she said, For twelve years I have had a pie measure stuck on my throat. Ask Karam Gosain for me how I am to get rid of it. And they promised. And going on they met a woman with a bundle of thatching grass stuck to her head. And she made them promise to ask Karam Gosain how she could be freed. Then they met a woman with both her feet burning in a fire, and another with a stool stuck fast to her back. And they promised to inquire how these might be delivered. So at last they came to the Ganges, and they stood on the bank, and called to Karam Gosain. And when he came, they caught hold of him, and he said, Fie, what low-caste person is touching me? But they said, It is no low-caste person, but Dharmu. Then they bathed him, and anointed him with oil and turmeric, and wrapped him in the new cloth which they had brought, and thus they persuaded him to return. So they rose up to go back. And Dharmu asked about the women whom they had met, and Karam Gosain said, The woman has a stool stuck to her back because when visitors came she never offered them a seat. Let her do so in future, and she will be freed. And the woman has her feet burning in the fire because she pushed the fuel into the fire with her foot. Let her not do so in future, and she will be freed. And the woman has the thatching grass stuck to her head, because when she saw a friend with straw sticking in her hair, she did not tell her about it. Let her do so in future, and she will be freed. And the woman has the pie measure stuck to her throat, because when her neighbor wanted to borrow her measure, she would not lend it. Let her do so in future, and she will be freed. And Karam Gosain asked whether they had seen an elephant, and a horse, and a buffalo, and a cow, and money, and mangoes, and figs. And Dharmu said yes, but that he had not been able to catch the animals, and the fruit was bad. Karam Gosain promised them that on their way back they should take possession of all. And they did so, and mounted on the elephant, and returned to their home with great wealth, on their way they met the four women, and told them how they could be saved from their troubles. The villagers welcomed Dharmu, and he arranged a great feast, and gave paddy to all the villagers to husk. But when they had boiled it, the weather became cloudy, so that they could not dry it. So they prayed to the sun, and he at once shone out and dried the paddy. Then a day was fixed, 
and they prepared rice beer and worshipped Karam Gosain, and they danced all night and got very drunk and enjoyed themselves. End of Karmu and Dharmu. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganus. Translated by Cecil Henry Bombas. Part 1. Chapter 6. The Jealous Stepmother. Recorded by Heather Lambert. There was once a man whose wife died, leaving him with one son, and after a year he married again. The second wife was very jealous of the son, and she told her husband that she would not stay with him unless he killed the boy. At first he refused, but she insisted, and then he said that he was frightened to do the deed, but she might kill the boy herself if she liked. She said, No, he is your son, and you must kill him. If he were mine, I would do it. You need not be frightened. When you take him out plowing, make him drive the front plow and you sharpen your plow pole to a point and drive it into him from behind and kill him, and then it will seem to be an accident. So the man promised and made a sharp point to his plow pole, but whenever they plowed, the son drove his plow so fast that the father could not catch him up, and so the boy was not killed. Then the woman abused her husband and said that he was deceiving her. So he promised to finish the business the next day, and told her to give the boy a good hot breakfast before they started, so that he might receive one last kindness, and he said that they must find some other way of killing him, because all the plowing was finished. But his wife told him he could plow down their crop of gondolai. The bullocks would stop to eat the gondolai as they went along, and so he would easily catch up to his son. Accordingly, the next morning, father and son took the plows, and the boy asked where they should plow, and the father said that they would plow down the field of gondolai. But the boy said, Why should we do that? It is a good crop and will be ripe in a day or two. It is too late to sow again. We shall lose this crop, and who knows whether we shall get anything in its place. And the father thought, What the boy says is true. The first crop is like the first child. If I kill him, who will support me in my old age? Who knows whether my second wife will have children? I will not kill him, however angry she be. So they unyoked their plows and went home. He told his wife that he would not kill the boy, and scolded her, and ended up giving her a beating. Then she ran away in a passion, but he did not trouble to go and look for her, and in a few days her father and brothers brought her back, and her husband told them what had happened, and they also scolded her, and told her to mend her ways. End of chapter 6 The Pious Woman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganas. Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas. Part 1. 7. The Pious Woman. There was once a very pious woman and her special virtue was that she would not eat or drink on any day until she had first given alms to a beggar one day no beggar came to her house so by noon she got tired of waiting and tying in her cloth some parched rice she went to the place where the women drew water when she got there she saw a jugi coming towards her she greeted him and said that she had brought dried rice for him he said that omens had bidden him come to her and that he came to grant her a boon she might ask one favor and it would be given her the woman said grant me this boon to know where our souls go after death and to see at the time of death how they escape whether through the nose or the mouth and where they go to and tell me when i shall die and where my soul will go to this i ask and no more then the jugi answered your prayer is granted but you must tell no one if you do, the power will depart from you. So saying, he took from his bag something like a feather, and brushed her eyes with it, and washed them with water. Then the woman's eyes were opened, and she saw spirits, bongas, boots, dains, churins, 
and the souls of dead men. And the Jugi told her not to be afraid, but not to speak to them, lest men should think her mad. Then he took his leave, and she returned home. Now in the village lived a poor man and his wife, and they were much liked because they were industrious and obedient. Shortly afterwards this poor man died, and the pious woman saw men come with a palanquin and take away the poor man's soul with great ceremony. She was pleased at the sight, and thought that the souls of all men were taken away like this. But shortly afterwards her father-in-law died. He had been a rich man, but harsh, and while the family were mourning, the pious woman saw four sipahis armed with iron-shod staves and of fierce countenance come to the house, and two entered and took the father-in-law by the neck and thrust him forth. They bound him and beat him. They knocked him down, and as he could not walk, they dragged him away by his legs. The woman followed him to the end of the garden, and when she saw him being dragged away, she screamed. When her husband's relatives saw her screaming and crying, they were angry and said that she must have killed her father-in-law by witchcraft, for she did not sit by the corpse and cry, but went to the end of the garden. So after the body had been burnt, they held a council and questioned her, and told her that they would hold her to be a witch if she could not explain. So she told them of the power which the Jugi had conferred on her and of what she had seen, and they believed her and acquitted her of the charge of witchcraft. But from that time she lost her power and saw no more spirits. End of the Pious Woman Recording by Justin Barrett, January 2008
the wise daughter-in-law. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganus Translated by Cecil Henry Bompus Part 1 Number 9 The Oilman and His Sons There was once an oilman with five sons, and they were all married and lived jointly with their father. But the daughters-in-law were discontented with this arrangement, and urged their husbands to ask their father to divide the family property. At first the old man refused, but when his sons persisted, he told them to bring him a log two cubits long and so thick that two hands could just span it, and he said that if they could break the log in two, he would divide the property. So they brought the log and then asked for axes, but he told them that they must break it themselves by snapping it or twisting it or standing on it. So they tried and failed. Then the old man said, You are five and I make six. Split the log into six. So they split it and he gave each a piece and told them to break them. And each easily snapped his stick. Then the old man said, We are like the whole log. We have plenty of property, and are strong, and can overcome attack. But if we separate, we shall be like the split sticks, and easily broken. They admitted that this was true, and proposed that the property should not be divided, but that they should all become separate in mess. But the father would not agree to this, for he thought that people would call him a miser if he let his sons live separately without his giving them their share in the property as their own. So as they persisted in their folly, he partitioned the property. But in a few years, they all fell into poverty and had not enough to eat nor clothes to wear, and the father and mother were no better off. Then the old man called all his sons and their wives and said, You see what trouble you have fallen into? I have a riddle for you. Explain it to me. There are four wells, three empty, and one full of water. If you draw water from the full one and pour it into the three empty ones, they will become full. But when they are full and the first one is empty, if you pour water from the three full ones into the empty one, it will not be filled. What does this mean? And they could not answer. And he said, The four wells mean that a man had three sons, and while they were little he filled their stomachs as the wells were filled with water. But when they separated, they would not fill the old man's stomach. And it was true that the sons had done nothing to help their father, and they were filled with shame, and they agreed that as long as their father lived, they would be joint with him and would not separate again until he died. End of The Oil Man and His Sons This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganus Translated by Cecil Harry Bompas Part 1 10. The Girl Who Found Helpers Once upon a time there were seven brothers, and they were all married, and they had one sister who was not married. The brothers went away to a far country for a whole year, leaving their wives at home. Now the wives hated their sister-in-law, and did their best to torment her. So one day they gave her a pot full of holes, and told her to bring it back full of water, and threatened that if she failed she should have no food. So she took the pot to the spring, and there sat down and cried, and sang, I am fetching water in a pot full of holes. I am fetching water in a pot full of holes. How far away have my brothers gone to trade? After she had cried a long time, a number of frogs came up out of the water and asked her what was the matter, and she told them that she must fill the pot with water and was not allowed to stop the holes with clay or lac. Then they told her not to cry and said that they would sit on the holes and then the water would not run out. They did this and the girl dried her eyes and filled the pot with water and took it home. Her sisters-in-law were much disappointed at her success, but the next day they told her to go to the jungle and to bring back a bundle of leaves. 
but she was to use no rope for tying them up. So she went to the jungle and collected the leaves, and then sat down and cried, and sang, I am to fetch leaves without a rope, I am to fetch leaves without a rope, how far have my brothers gone to trade? And as she cried, a bukasobo snake came out and asked why she was crying, and when she told it, it said it would coil itself round the leaves in place of a rope. So it stretched itself out straight, and she piled the leaves on top, and the snake coiled itself tightly round them, and so she was able to carry the bundle home on her head. Her sisters-in-law ran to see how she managed it, but she put the bundle down gently, and the snake slipped away unperceived. Still, they resolved to try again. So the next day they sent her to fetch a bundle of firewood, but told her that she was to use no rope to tie it with. So she went to the jungle and collected the sticks, and then sat down and cried. I am to bring wood without tying it. I am to bring wood without tying it. How far have my brothers gone to trade? And as she cried, a python came out and asked what was the matter. And when it heard, it told her not to cry, and said it would act as a rope to bind up the sticks. So it stretched itself out, and she laid the sticks on it, and then it coiled itself round them, and she carried the bundle home. As the sisters-in-law had been baffled thus, they resolved on another plan, and proposed they should all go and gather sticks in the jungle. And on the way home they came to a machunda tree in full flower, and they wanted to pick some of the flowers. The wicked sisters-in-law at first began to climb the tree, but they pretended that they could not, and kept slipping down. Then they hoisted their sister-in-law into the branches, and told her to throw down the flowers to them. But while she was in the tree, they tied thorns around the trunk so that she could not descend, and then left her to starve. After she had been in the tree a long time, her brothers passed that way on their return journey, and sat down under the tree to rest. The girl was too weak to speak, but she cried, and her tears fell on the back of her eldest brother. And he looked up and saw her. Then they rescued her and revived her and listened to her story, and they were very angry and vowed to have revenge. So they gave their sister some needles and put her in a sack, and put the sack on one of the pack bullocks. And when they got home, they took the sack off gently, and told their wives to carry it carefully inside the house, and on no account to put it down. But when the wives took it up, the girl inside pricked them with the needles so that they screamed and let the sack fall. Their husbands scolded them and made them take it up again, and they had to carry it in, though they were pricked until the blood ran down. Then the brothers inquired about all that had happened in their absence, and at last asked after their sister, and their wives said that she had gone into the jungle with some friends to get firewood. But the brothers turned on them and told them how they had found her in the Machunda tree, and brought her home in a sack, and their wives were dumbfounded. Then the brothers said they had made a vow to dig a well and consecrate it. So they set to work to dig a well two fathoms across and three fathoms deep, and when they reached water they fixed a day for the consecration and they told their wives to put on their best clothes and to do the kumara ceremony at the well. So the wives went to the well, escorted by drummers, and as they stood in a row round the well, each man pushed his own wife into it, and then they covered the well with a wooden grating and kept them in it for a whole year, and at the end of the year they pulled them out again. Another version of this story gives three other tasks preliminary to those given above and begins as follows. Once upon a time there was a girl named Hira who had seven brothers. The brothers went away to a far country to trade, leaving her alone in the house with their wives. These seven sisters-in-law hated Hira and did what they could to torment her. One day they sowed a basket full of mustard seed in a field and then told her to go and pick it all up. She went into the field and began to lament, singing, They have sown a basket of mustard seed. Oh, how far away have my brothers gone to trade? As she cried, a flock of pigeons came rustling down and asked her what was the matter, and when they heard, they told her to be comforted. They at once set to work, picking up the mustard grain by grain and putting it into her basket. Soon the basket was quite full, and she joyfully took it home and showed it to her sisters-in-law. Then they set her another task and told her to bring them some bear's hair that they might weave it into a hair armlet for her wedding. So she went off to the jungle and sat down to cry. As she wept, Two bear cubs came up and asked her what was the matter. When she told her story, they bade her be of good cheer and took her into their cave and hid her. Presently the mother bear came back and suckled her cubs. And when they had finished, they asked their mother to leave them some of her hair, that they might amuse themselves by plaiting it while she was away. She did so, and directly she had gone off to look for food, the cubs gave the girl the hair and sent her home rejoicing. 
The sisters-in-law were only made more angry by her success, and plotted how to kill her, so they ordered her to bring them some tiger's milk, that they might make it into curds for her wedding. Then she went off to the jungle and began to weep, singing, I brought the hair of a bear, how far away have my brothers gone to trade? At the sound, two tiger cubs came running up, and asked what was the matter. They told her to be comforted, and they would manage to give her what she wanted. They took her and hid her near where they were lying. Presently the tigers came back and suckled her cubs, and as she did so she declared that she smelt a human being. But the cubs laughed at her and said that it must be they whom she smelt, so she was satisfied. And as she was leaving them, they asked her to leave some of her milk in an earthen pot, so they might have something to drink if she was long in coming back. The tigress did so, and directly she was gone, the cubs gave the milk to the girl who took it home. The story then continues as before. End of The Girl Who Found Helpers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganas, translated by Cecil Henry Bompas, Part One, Eleven, How to Grow Rich, recorded by Dan Three Trees. Once upon a time, there was a woman whose husband died while she was pregnant, and she was very unhappy and used to pray daily to sing Chando to give her a man-child in place of her husband. She was left well off, and among her property were three gold coins and as she was afraid of these being stolen, she decided to place them in the care of the village headman. So she took them to him, and asked him to keep them till her child was born, and no one was present at the time but the headman's wife. In due time her child was born, and by the mercy of Sing Chando it was a son, and when the boy had grown a bit and could run alone, his mother decided to take back the gold coins. So she went to the headman and asked him for them, but he and his wife said, we do not understand what you are talking about. We know of no gold coins. Where are your witnesses? You must have had witnesses in such a business. And they drove her out. She went away crying and called the villagers together and asked them to decide the matter. So they questioned her and the headman, but as it was word against word, they could come to no decision. So they settled to put the parties on oath. But the headman and the woman both swore that they had spoken the truth, saying, May we die if we have spoken falsely. Then the villagers made them swear by their children, and the woman and the headman laid their hands on the heads of their sons and swore. And when the woman swore, her son fell down dead, and she took up the dead body in her arms and ran away with it. The villagers were very sorry for what had happened, but the headman and his wife abused them for not having believed their word. The woman had not gone very far before she met a stranger who asked why she was crying, and when she told him, he said, Do not cry. You told one falsehood, and so your son has died. Take your child back to the villagers and tell them that it was five gold coins and not three that you gave to the headman, and if you do this, the child will come to life again. So the woman hastened back and found the villagers still assembled, and she told them as the stranger had directed and she agreed to be sworn again on the body of the child, and the headman promised to pay five gold pieces if the child were restored to life. So the woman laid her hands on the dead child and swore, and it was restored to life. Then the headman was dumbfounded, and reluctantly brought out five gold pieces and gave them to the woman. She gave five rupees to the villagers, and they made the headman give them ten rupees for having deceived them, and they bought pigs and had a feast. In the course of time, the boy grew up, and his mother urged him to marry. He asked her if she knew how to choose a wife, and also what sort of cattle to buy. And she said that she did not know. Her husband had not told her this. So the youth said that he would go to Sing Chando and ask. His mother washed his clothes for him, and gave him food for the journey, and he set out. On the way, he met a man who asked him where he was going, and he answered, that he was going to make a petition to sing Chando. Then, said the man, make a petition for me also. I have so much wealth that I cannot look after it all. Ask him to take away half from me. The youth promised and went on, and he met another man, 
who said that he had so many cattle that he could not build enough cowhouses for them, and asked him to petition Sing Chando to diminish their number. And he promised, and went on, and came to Sing Chando, and there he asked how to choose a wife and how to buy cattle. And Sing Chando said, When you buy a bullock, first put your hand on its quarter, and if it shrinks and tries to get free, buy it. And when you want a wife, inquire first as to the character of her father and mother. Good parents make good children. Then the youth asked about the two men he had met. Sing Chando said, Tell the first man, when he is plowing, to plow two or three furrows beyond the boundary of his field, and his wealth will diminish. And tell the second man to drive away three or four of his cattle every day, and their number will decrease. So the youth returned, and met the man who had too many cattle, and told him what Chando had said. And the man thought, If I drive away three or four head of cattle every day, I shall soon become poor. So from that time he looked out for any straying cattle and would drive them home with his own. If the owner claimed them, he gave them up. But if no claimant appeared, he kept them, and so he became richer than ever. And the youth went on and met the man who was too rich. And when he heard what Chando had said, he thought, If I plow over the boundary onto my neighbor's land, it will be a great sin, and I shall soon become poor. And he went to his plowman and told them never to plow right up to the edge of the field, but to leave two or three furrows space. And they obeyed, and from that time he grew richer than ever. And the youth returned to his mother, and told her all that had happened, and they understood the meaning of the advice which Chando had given to the two men, and acted accordingly. And it is true that we see that avaricious men, who trespass across boundaries, become poor. End of How to Grow Rich This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parangas Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas Part 1 XII The Changed Calf Recorded by Tim Bulkley BigBible.org There was once a cowherd named Sona, who'd saved a few rupees, and he wanted to buy a calf so as to have something to show for his labours. And he went to a distant village and bought a bull calf, and on the way home he was benighted. So he turned into a Hindu village and went to an oilman's house, and asked to be allowed to sleep there. When the oilman saw such a fine calf, he coveted it, and he told Sona to put it in the stable along with his own bullock, and he gave him some supper and let him sleep on the veranda. But in the middle of the night the oilman got up and moistened some oil cake and plastered it over the calf. Then he untied his own bullock and made it lick the oil cake off the calf. And as the bullock was accustomed to eat oil cake, it licked it greedily. Then the oilman raised a cry. The bullock that turns the oil mill has given birth to a calf. And all the villagers collected, and saw the bullock licking the calf, and they believed the oilman. Sona did not wake up, and knew nothing of all this. The next morning he got up, and went to untie his calf and drive it away. But the oilman would not let him, and claimed the calf as his own. Then Sona called the villagers to come and decide the matter. But they said that they had seen him bring no calf to the village, and he had not called any of them to witness it. But they had seen the bullock licking the calf. Why should the bullock lick any but its own calf? No one ever saw a bullock lick a strange bullock or cow. So they awarded the calf to the oilman. Then Sona said that he would call someone to argue the matter, and he went away, meaning to get some men from the next village. But he lost his way in the jungle, and as he went along a nightjar flew up from under his feet. He called out to it to stay, as he was in great distress, and the bird alighted and asked what was the matter. And Sona told it his trouble. Then the nightjar said that it would argue the matter for him, but that he must have a colleague, and it told Sona to go on and ask the first living being he met to help. So he went on and met a jackal, and the jackal agreed to help the nightjar, and they told him to call the villagers to the edge of the village 
but not to let them bring any dogs with them. So Sona brought all the villagers to the jungle, and the nightjar and the jackal sat side by side on a stone. Then Sona asked the villagers whether they would let him take away the calf or no, and they persisted in their previous opinion. At last one man said, What are your advocates doing? It seems to me that they are asleep. At this the two woke up with a start and looked about them, and the nightjar said, I have been asleep and dreamed a dream. Will you men please hear it and explain its meaning? And the jackal said, I too have had a dream. Please explain it for me. If you can explain the meaning you shall keep the calf, and if not the boy shall have it. The villagers told them to speak, and the nightjar said, I saw two nightjars' eggs, and one egg was sitting on the other. No mother bird was sitting on them. Tell me what this means. And the jackal said, I saw the sea was on fire, and the fishes were all being burnt up, and I was busy eating them, and that's why I did not wake up. What is the meaning of this dream? And the villagers said, The two dreams are both alike. Neither has any meaning. An egg can't sit on an egg, and the sea cannot catch fire. The jackal said, Why cannot it be? If you won't believe that the water can catch fire, why do you say that a bullock gave birth to a calf? Have you ever seen such a thing? Speak!" And they admitted that they had never seen a bullock have a calf, but only cows. Then, said the jackal, explain why you have given the oilman a decree. And they admitted that they were wrong, and awarded the calf to Sona, and fined the oilman five rupees for having deceived them. End of the Changed Calf this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganus, translated by Cecil Henry Bompas. LibriVox, Volume 1. 13. The Cowrie and the Barber. There was a well to do man of the Cowrie, cultivating caste and opposite his house lived a barber who was very poor and the barber thought that if he carried on his cultivation just as the kauri did he might get better results so every day he made some pretext to visit the kauri's house and hear what work he was going to do the next day and with the same object he would listen outside his house at night and he exactly imitated the kauri he yoked his cattle and unyoked them. He plowed and sowed and transplanted just when the Kauri did. And the result was good. For that year, he got a very fine crop. But he was not content with this and resolved to continue to copy the Kauri. The Kauri suspected what the barber was doing and did not like it, so he resolved to put the matter to the test and at the same time teach the barber to mind his own business. In January they both planted sugar cane, and one day, when the crop was half grown, the barber was sitting at the Kauri's house, and the Kauri gave orders to his servants to put the leveler over the crop the next day and break it down. This was only a pretense of the Kauri's. But the barber went away, and the next day crushed his sugar cane crop with the leveler. The whole village laughed to see what he had done. But it turned out that each root of the barber's sugar cane sent up a number of shoots, and in the end he had a much heavier crop than the Kauri. Another day the Kauri announced that he was going to sow but pulse and therefore ordered his servants to bring out the seed and roast it well that it might germinate quickly and the barber hearing this went off and had his seed butt roasted and the next day he sowed it but only a very few seeds germinated and the crop of the kauri which had not really been roasted sprouted finely the barber asked the kauri why his crop had not come up well, and the Kauri told him that it must be because he had not roasted the seed enough. The few seeds that had come up must have been those which had been roasted most. 
But in the end, the laugh was against the cowery, for the few seeds of the barbers which germinated produced such fine plants that when he came to thresh them out, he had more grain than the cowery. And so in three or four years, the barber became the richer man of the two. End of The Cowery and the Barber This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganas Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas Part 1, Number 14 The Prince Who Acquired Wisdom There was once a Raja who had an only son and the Raja was always urging his son to learn to read and write, in order that when he came to his kingdom he might manage well and be able to decide disputes that were brought to him for judgment. But the boy paid no heed to his father's advice and continued to neglect his lessons. At last, when he was grown up, the prince saw that his father was right, and he resolved to go away to foreign countries to acquire wisdom. So he set off without telling any one but his wife, and he took with him a purse of money and three pieces of gold. After traveling a long time, he one day saw a man plowing in a field, and he went and got some tobacco from him, and asked him whether there were any wise men living in that neighborhood. "'What do you want with wise men?' asked the plowman. The prince said that he was traveling to get wisdom. The plowman said that he would give him instruction if he were paid. Then the prince promised to give him one gold piece for each piece of wisdom. The plowman agreed and said, Listen attentively. The first maxim is this. You are the son of a Raja. Whenever you go to visit a friend or one of your subjects, and they offer you a bedstead or stool or mat to sit on, do not sit down at once, but move the stool or mat a little to one side. This is one maxim. Give me my gold coin. So the prince paid him. Then the plowman said, The second maxim is this. You are the son of a Raja. Whenever you go to bathe, do not bathe at the common bathing place, but at a place by yourself. Give me my coin. And the prince did so. Then he continued, My third maxim is this. You are the son of a Raja. When men come to you for advice or to have a dispute decided, listen to what the majority of those present say, and do not follow your own fancy. Now pay me. And the prince gave him his last gold coin, and said that he had no more. Well, said the plowman, your lesson is finished, but still... I will give you one more piece of advice, free, and it is this. You are the son of a Raja. Restrain your anger. If anything you see or hear makes you angry, still do not at once take action. Hear the explanation and weigh it well. Then if you find cause, you can give rein to your anger, and if not, let the offender off. After this, the prince set his face homewards, as he had spent all his money, and he began to repent of having spent his gold pieces on advice that seemed worthless. However, on his way, he turned into a bazaar to buy some food, and the shopkeepers on all sides called out, Buy! Buy! So he went to his shop, and the shopkeeper invited him to sit on a rug. He was just about to do so when he remembered the maxim of his instructor and pulled the rug to one side, and when he did so he saw that it had been spread over the mouth of a well, and that if he had sat on it he would have been killed. So he began to believe in the wisdom of his teacher. Then he went on his way, and on the road he turned aside to a tank to bathe, and remembering the maxim of his teacher he did not bathe at the common place but went to a place apart. Then, having eaten his lunch, he continued his journey. But he had not gone far when he found that he had left his purse behind, so he turned back and found it lying at the place where he had put down his things when he bathed. 
Thereupon he applauded the wisdom of his teacher, for if he had bathed at the common bathing place, someone would have seen the purse and have taken it away. When evening came on, he turned into a village and asked the headman to let him sleep in his veranda, and there was already one other traveller sleeping there, and in the morning it was found that the traveller had died in his sleep. Then the headman consulted the villagers, and they decided that there was nothing to be done but to throw away the body, and that as the prince was also a traveller, he should do it. At first he refused to touch the corpse, as he was the son of a raja. But the villagers insisted, and then he bethought himself of the maxim that he should not act contrary to the general opinion. So he yielded and dragged away the body, and threw it into a ravine. Before leaving it he remembered that it was proper to remove the clothes, and when he began to do so he found round the waist of the body a roll of coin. So he took this and was glad that he had followed the advice of his teacher. That evening he reached the boundary of his own territory and decided to press on home, although it was dark. At midnight he reached the palace and without arousing anyone went to the door of his wife's room. Outside the door he saw a pair of shoes and a sword. At the sight he became wild with rage, and drawing the sword he called out, Who is in my room? As a matter of fact, the prince's wife had got the prince's little sister to sleep with her, and when the girl heard the prince's voice she got up to leave. But when she opened the door and saw the prince standing with the drawn sword, she drew back in fear. She told him who she was and explained that they had put the shoes and sword at the door to prevent anyone else from entering. But in his wrath the prince would not listen and called to her to come out and be killed. Then she took off her cloth and showed it to him through the crack of the door, and at the sight of this he was convinced. Then he reflected on the advice of his teacher and repented because he had nearly killed his sister through not restraining his wrath. End of The Prince Who Acquired Wisdom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. Folklore of the Santal Parganas Translated by Cecil Henry Bombas Part 1 Roman numeral 15 The Monkey Boy Recorded by Jessica of South Carolina There was a man who had six sons and two daughters, and he died leaving his wife pregnant of a ninth child, and when the child was born it proved to be a monkey. The villagers and relations advised the mother to make away with it, but she refused, saying, Chanda knows why he's given me such a child, but as he has done, so I will rear it. All her relations said that if she chose to rear a monkey, they would turn her out of the family. However, she persisted that she would do so at all cost. So they sent her to live with her child in a hut outside the village, and the monkey boy grew up and learned to talk like a human being. One day his elder brothers began to clear the jungle for cultivation, and the monkey boy took a hatchet and went with them. He asked where he could clear his land for himself, and in fun they showed him the place where the jungle was thickest. So he went there and drove his hatchet into the trunk of a tree, and then returned and watched his brothers working hard clearing the scrub. And when they had finished their work, he went and fetched his hatchet and returned home with them. Every day he did the same and one day his brother asked why he spent all his time with them, and he said that he only came to them when he was tired of cutting down trees. They laughed at this and said that they would like to see his clearing, so he took them to the place, and to their astonishment they saw a large clearing, bigger than they had been able to make for themselves. Then the brothers burnt the jungle they had cut down and began to plow the land. But the monkey boy's mother had no plow or cattle, nor any seed rice. The only thing in the house was a pumpkin, so he took the seed out of the pumpkin and sowed it in his clearing. His brothers asked what he had sown, and he told them, rice. 
The brothers plowed and sowed, and used to go daily to watch the growing crop. And one day they went to have a look at the monkey boy's crop, and they saw that it was pumpkins and not rice, and they laughed at him. When their crop was ripe, the brothers prepared to offer the first fruits, and the monkey boy watched them, that he might observe the same ceremonies as they. One day they brought home the first fruits and offered them to the bongas, and they invited the monkey boy and his mother to come to the feast which followed the offering. They both went and enjoyed themselves, and two or three days later the monkey boy said that he would also have a feast of first fruits. So he told his mother to clear the courtyard, invited his brothers, and he purified himself, and went to his clearing and brought home the biggest pumpkin that had grown there. This he offered to the spirits. He sliced off the top of it as if it were the head of a fowl, and as he did so he saw that the inside was full of rice. He called his mother and they filled a winnowing fan with the rice, and there was enough besides to nearly fill a basket. They were delighted at this windfall, but kept the matter a secret, lest they should be robbed. The monkey boy told his mother to be sure and cook enough rice, so that his brothers and their wives might have as much as ever they could eat, and not merely a small helping such as they had given him, and if necessary he would go and fetch another pumpkin. So his mother boiled the rice. When the time fixed for the feast came, nothing was to be seen of the brothers, because they did not expect that there would really be anything for them to eat. So the monkey boy went and fetched them, and when they came to the feast they were astonished to have as much rice as they could eat. When the crop was quite ripe, the monkey boy gathered all the pumpkins and got sufficient rice from them to last for the whole year. After this the brothers went out to buy horses. The monkey boy went with them, and as he had no money, he took nothing but a coil of rope. His brothers were ashamed to have them with him, and drove him away. So he went on ahead and got first to the place where the horse dealer lived. The brothers arrived late in the evening and decided to make their purchases the following morning and ride their horses home. So they camped for the night. The monkey boy spent the night hiding on the rafters of the stable, and in the night the horses began to talk to each other and discussed which could gallop farthest. And one mare said, I can gallop twelve coasts on the ground and then twelve coasts in the air. When the monkey boy heard this he got down and lamed the mare by running a splinter into her hoof. The next morning the brothers bought the horses which pleased them and rode off. When the monkey boy went to the horse dealer and asked why the mare was lame and advised him to apply remedies. But the dealer said that that was useless. When horses got ill they always died. Then the monkey boy asked if he would sell the mare and offered to give the coil of rope in exchange. The dealer, thinking that the animal was useless, agreed. So the monkey boy led it away. But when he was out of sight, he took out the splinter, and the lameness at once ceased. Then he mounted the mare and rode after his brothers, and when he had nearly overtaken them, he rose into the air and flew past his brothers, and arrived first at home. There he tied up the mare outside his house, and went and bathed, and had his dinner, and waited for his brothers. They did not arrive for a full hour afterwards, and when they saw the monkey boy and his mount, they wanted to know how he had got home first. He boasted of how swift his mare was, and so they arranged to have a race and matched their horses against his. The race took place two or three days later, and the monkey boy's mare easily beat all the other horses. She galloped twelve coasts on the ground and twelve coasts in the air. Then they wanted to change their horses for his, but he said they had first choice, and he was not going to change. In two or three years the monkey boy became rich, and then he announced that he wanted to marry. This puzzled his mother, for she thought that no human girl would marry him while a monkey would not be able to talk. So she told him that he must find a bride for himself. One day he set off to look for a wife, came to a tank in which some girls were bathing, and he took up the cloth belonging to one of them and ran up a tree with it. And when the girl missed it and saw it hanging down from the tree, she borrowed a cloth from her friends and went and asked the monkey boy for her own. He told her that she could only have it back, she consented to marry him. She was surprised to find that he could talk, and as he conversed she was bewitched by him, and let him pull her up into the tree by her hair, and she called out to her friends to go home and leave her where she was. Then he took her on his back and ran off home with her. The girl's father and relations turned out with bows and arrows to look for the monkey who had carried her off, but he had gone so far away that they never found him. When the monkey boy appeared with his bride all the villagers were astonished that he had found anyone to marry him, but everything was made ready for the marriage as quickly as possible, and all the relations were invited, 
The wedding took place, and the monkey boy and his wife lived happily ever after. End of The Monkey Boy The Miser's Servant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganas Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas Part 1 16. The Miser's Servant Recorded by Anna Simon Once there was a rich man who was a miser. Although he kept farm servants, they would never stay out the year with him, but ran away in the middle. When the villagers asked why they ran away, and so lost their year's wages, the servants answered, "'You would do the same in our place. At the busy time of the year he speaks us fair and feeds us well, but directly the crops are gathered he begins to starve us. This year we have had nothing to eat since September.' And the villagers said, "'Well, that is a good reason. A man can stand scolding, but not starvation. We all work to fill our bellies. Hunger is the worst disease of all.' The news that the miser made his servants work for nothing spread throughout the neighborhood, so he could get no servants nearby, and when he brought them from a distance they soon heard of his character and ran away. Men would only work for him on daily wages, and because of his miserliness they demanded higher wages than usual from him, and would not work without. Now there was a young fellow named Cora who heard all this, and he said, If I were that man's servant, I would not run away. I would get the better of him. Ask him if he wants a servant, and if he says yes, take me to him. The man to whom Cora told this went to the miser and informed him that Cora was willing to engage himself to him. So Cora was fetched, and they had a drink of rice beer, and then the miser asked Cora whether he would work for the full year and not run away in the middle. Cora said that he would stay if we were satisfied with the wages. The master said, I will fix your wages when I see your work. If you are handy at everything, I will give you twelve cuts of rice, and if you are only a moderate worker, then nine or ten cuts, besides your clothes. How much do you ask for? And Cora said, Well, listen to me. I hear that your servants run away in the middle of the year because you give them so little to eat. All I ask for my wages is that you give me once a year one grain of rice, and I will sow it, and you must give me low land to plant all the seed that I get from it, and give me one seed of maize, and I will sow it for seed and you must give me upland to sow all the seed I get from it. And give me the customary quantity of clothes, and for food give me one leaf full of rice three times a day. I only want what will go on a single leaf. You need not sew several leaves together into a plate. I will ask for no second helping, but if you do not fill the leaf full, I shall have the right to abuse you, and if I do not do all the work you give me properly, then you can abuse me and beat me. If I run away from fear of hard work, you may cut off the little finger of my right hand, and if you do not give me the wages we have agreed upon, then I shall have the right to cut off the little finger of your hand. What do you say to this proposal? Consult your friends and give me your answer. Then the miser answered, I engage you on these terms, and if I turn you off without reason, you may cut off my little finger. Then Cora turned to the man who had fetched him, and said, Listen to all this. If there is any dispute hereafter— you will be my witness. So Cora began to work, and the first day they gave him rice on a single sal leaf, and he ate it up in one mouthful. But the next day he brought a plantain leaf, which is some three feet long, and said, Give me my rice on this, and mind you fill it full. And they refused. But he said, Why not? It is only a single leaf. And they had to give in, because he was within his rights. So he ate as much as he wanted and every day he brought a plantain leaf, till his master's wife got tired and said to her husband, Why have you got a servant like this? He takes a whole pot of rice to himself every day. But he answered, Never mind, his wages are nothing, he's working for his keep alone. So the whole year Korak got his plantain leaf filled, and he was never lazy over his work, so they could find no fault with him on that score. And when the year was up, they gave him one grain of rice and one seed of maize for his wages for the year. Cora kept them carefully, and his master's sons laughed at him and said, Mind you don't drop them or let a mouse eat them. Cora said nothing, but when the time for sowing maize came, he took his grain of maize and sowed it by the dung heap, and he called them to see where he sowed it. And at the time of sowing rice, he sowed his grain separately, and when the time for transplanting came, he planted his rice seedling in a hollow and bade them note it. 
When the maize ripened, it was found that his plant had two big cobs and one small one on it, and his rice seedling sent up a number of ears. And when it ripened, he cut it and thrashed it and got one pie of rice, and he kept the maize and rice for seed. And the next year also he sowed this seed separately, and it produced a big basket of rice and another one of maize, and he kept this also for seed. And in the course of five or six years he had taken all their high lands to sow his seed in, and in a few years more he had taken all their rice lands too. Then his master was very miserable, but he saw that it was useless to make any complaint, and the master became so poor that he had to work as a servant to Cora. At last the miser called the heads of the village together and wept before them, and they had pity on him and interceded for him. But Cora said, "'It is God who has punished him, and not I. He made poor men work for nothing for so long, and now he has to suffer.' But they asked him to be merciful and give him some land, and he agreed, and said, "'Cut off his little finger, and I will let him off his bargain, and call all the servants whom he has defrauded, and I will pay them.' But the miser would not have his finger cut off. Then Cora said, "'Let him keep his finger, and I will give him back half his land.' The miser agreed to this, and promised to treat his servants well in the future, and in order to lessen his shame he married his daughter to Cora, and he had to admit that it was by his own folly that this trouble had befallen him. End of the Miser's Servant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Paragonis Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas Part 1, Number 17 Kuwar and the Raja's Daughter Recorded by Kirk Thomas, Atlanta, Georgia There was once a rich merchant who lived in a Raja's city and the Raja founded a school in order that his own children might have some education. And the boys and girls of the town used to go to the school as well as the Raja's sons and daughters, and among them the rich merchant's son, whose name was Kuar. In the course of time the children all learned to read and write. In the evenings all the boys used to mount their horses and go for a ride. Now it happened that Kuwar and the Raja's daughter fell in love with each other, and she wrote him a letter saying that if he did not marry her, she would forcibly install herself in his house. He wrote back and begged her not to come to his house, as this would be the ruin of his family, but he said that he would willingly run away with her to a distant country and spend his whole life with her, if she would overlook the fact that they were of different castes and if she agreed to this, they must settle to what country to go. Somehow news of their intention got about, and the Raja was told that his daughter was in love with the merchant's son. Then the Raja gave orders that his daughter was not to be allowed to go outside the palace, and the merchant spoke severely to Kuwar, and neither of them was allowed to go to the school any more. But one day the princess went to the place where the Raja's horses were tied up, and among them was a mare named Piari. And she went up to the mare and said, You have eaten our salt for a long time. Will you now requite me? And Piari said, Certainly I will. Then the princess asked, If I mount you, will you jump over all these horses and this wall and escape? And the mare said, Yes, but you will have to hold on very tight. The princess said, That is my lookout. It is settled that on the day I want you, you will jump over the wall and escape. Then she wrote a letter to Kuwar, and gave it to her maidservant to deliver into Kuwar's own hands, without letting anyone know, and in the letter she fixed a day for their elopement, and told Kuwar to wait for her by a certain tree. So on the day fixed, after everyone was asleep, Kuwar went to the tree, and almost at once, the princess came to him riding on Piari. He asked her how she had escaped, and whether she had been seen, and she told him how the mare had jumped over the wall without anyone knowing. Then they both mounted Piari and drove her like the wind, 
and in one night they passed through the territory of two or three rajas, and in the morning were in a far country. Then they dismounted to cook their rice, and went to the house of an old woman to ask for a light with which to light their fire. Now this old woman had seven sons, and they were all robbers and murderers, and six of them had killed travelers and carried off their wives and married them. When Kuwar and the princess came asking for a light, the seven sons were away hunting, and when the old woman saw the princess, she resolved to marry her to her youngest son, and made a plan to delay them. So she asked them to cook their rice at her house, and offered them cooking pots and water pots and firewood and everything necessary. They did not know that she meant to kill Kuwar, and unsuspiciously accepted her offer. When they had finished cooking, Kuwar asked the old woman whether she lived alone, and she told him that she was a widow but had seven sons, and they were all away on a trading expedition. The old woman kept on looking out to see if her sons were returning, and she had made an arrangement with them that, if she ever wanted them, she would set fire to a small hut, and they would come home at once when they saw the smoke rising. But before her sons came back, Kuwar and the princess finished their meal and paid the old woman and mounted Piari and galloped off. Then the old woman set fire to the hut and her sons, seeing the smoke, hurried home. She told them that a beautiful girl had just left who would make a suitable wife for the youngest of the brothers. Then the brothers tied on their swords and mounted their horses and went in pursuit. Kuwar and the princess knew nothing of their danger, and rode on happily, but presently they heard horses neighing behind them, and, looking round, saw men riding after them with drawn swords. Then the princess said to Kuwar, Our enemies are upon us. Do you sit in front, and let me sit behind you, then they will kill us both together. If I am in front, they may kill you alone, and carry me off alive. But while they were thinking of this, the seven brothers caught them up, and began to abuse them and charge them with having set fire to the house in which they had eaten their rice, and told them to come back with them at once. Kuwar and the princess were too frightened to answer, and they had no sword with which to defend themselves. Then the robbers surrounded them, and killed Kuwar. And they said to the princess, You cannot stay here all alone. We will take you back, and you shall marry one of us. The princess answered, Kill me here at once. Never will I go with you. They said, We shall take away your horse and all your food. Will not that make you go? But the princess threw herself on the dead body of Kuwar, and for all they could do, they could not drag her off it. Then the murderers said to the youngest brother, She is to be your wife. You must pull her away. But he refused, saying, No, if I take her away, she will not stay with me. She will probably hang herself or drown herself. I do not want a wife like that. If any of you want her, you can have her. But they said it would not be right for one of them to take a second wife while their youngest brother was unmarried, and that their mother intended him to marry this girl. If he would not, they would kill her there and then. But the youngest brother had pity on her and asked them to spare her life. So they took away her horse and her food and everything that she had, and went away and left her there. For a day and a night the princess lay there weeping and lamenting her dead Kuwar, and never ceased for a moment. Then Chando said, Who is this who is weeping, and what has happened to her? And he sent Bidhi and Bidha to see what was the matter. They came and told him, that a princess was weeping over the body of her dead husband, and would not leave him, though she had been robbed of everything she had. Then Chandok told them to go and frighten her, and if they could frighten her away from her husband's dead body, he would do nothing. But if she would not leave him, then they were to restore him to life. So they went and found her holding the dead body of her husband in her lap and weeping. And they first assumed the form of tigers, and began to circle round her, roaring, but she only went on weeping, and sang, 
You have come roaring, Tigress. First eat me, Tigress. Then only will I let you eat the body of my lord. She would not quit the body nor run away from fear of the tigers, so they slunk away and came back in the form of two leopards and prowled around her growling. But she only sang, You have come roaring, leopardess. First eat me, leopardess. Then only will I let you eat the body of my lord. And, as she would not fly from them, they slunk away and came back in the form of two bears, but the princess only sang the same song. Then they appeared as two elephants, and then as two huge snakes which hissed terribly, but still she only wept, and in many forms they tried to frighten her away, but she would not move nor leave the corpse of Kuwar. So in the end they saw that all the heart of the princess was with Kuwar, and that even in death they could not be separated. So at last they drew near to her in the form of human beings, and asked why she was crying, as they had heard her weeping from a long way off, and had been filled with pity for her lamentations. Then the princess said, Alas, this youth and I are from such and such a country, and as we loved, and our lives were bound up in each other, we ran away together hither, and here on the road he has been killed, and the murderers have left me without my horse or food, and this is why I weep. Then Bidhi and Bidha said, Daughter, rise up, and we will take you to your home, or we will find you another husband. This one is dead and cannot be restored to you. You will find another. Come, arise. You have but one life. But the princess answered, No, I will not go and leave him here. I will not leave him while my life lasts. But I pray you, if you know of any medicine that might restore him to life, to try it. Then they answered, We know something of medicine, and if you wish, we will try to cure him. So saying, they ground up some simples, and told the princess to spread out a cloth, and lay the dead body on it, and to put the head, which had been cut off, into position, and then to cover it with the cloth, and hold the head in position. So she did as they bade, and they rubbed the medicine on the body, and then they suddenly disappeared from her sight. Then in a few moments she saw Kuwar's chest heave as if he were breathing. Thereupon she shook him violently, and he rose up and said, Oh, what a long time I have slept! But the princess said, Do not talk of sleep. You were killed, and two men appeared from somewhere and applied medicine, and brought you to life again. Then Kuwar asked where they were, and she told him how they had disappeared without her knowledge. Then they rose up and went in search of food, to a village where there was a bazaar, and they tried to get employment as servants but the people advised them to go to the capital city where the Raja lived, and there, if no one would take them as servants, they could get employment as coolies on a big tank which the Raja was excavating. So they went there, and as they could not get employment as servants, they went to work at the tank with the common coolies, and were paid their wages at the end of the week, and so managed to live. Kuwar's desire was to somehow save five or six rupees and then build a little house for themselves. Now, although the tank had been dug very deep, there were no signs of any water. Then the Raja ordered the center post to be planted, in hopes that this would make the water rise, and he told the coolies not to run away, as he would make a feast to celebrate the making of the tank, and would distribute presents among them, and at this the laborers were very pleased. Now Kuwar's wife was very fair to see, and the Raja saw her and fell in love with her, and made a plot to get possession of her. So when the center post had been planted, and still no water came, he said, We must see what sacrifice is required to make the water come. I have animals of all kinds. One by one they shall be offered, and you shall sing and dedicate them. So first an elephant was led down into the bed of the tank, and the people sang, Tank, we will sacrifice to you an elephant. Let clear water bubble up, O tank. 
but no water came. Then they led down a horse and sang a similar song, but no water came. And then in succession a camel, a donkey, a cow, a buffalo, a goat, and a sheep were offered, but no water came, and so they stopped. Then the Raja asked why they stopped, and they said that they had no more animals. Then the Raja bade them sing a song dedicating a man to see if that would bring the water. So they sang, and as they sang, water bubbled up everywhere from the bottom of the tank, and then the coolies were stricken with fear, for they did not know which of them would be sacrificed. But the Raja sent his soldiers, and they seized Kuwar, and bound him to the post in the middle of the tank, and then a song was sung dedicating him to the tank, and as the water rose around him, the princess wept bitterly. But the Raja said, Do not cry, I will arrange for your support, and will give you part of my kingdom, and you shall live in my palace. The princess said, Yes, hereafter I may stay with you, but let me now watch Kuwar till he is drowned. So Kuwar fixed his eyes on the princess, and tears streamed down his face until the waters rose and covered him and the princess also gazed at him till he was drowned. Then the Raja's soldiers told her to come with them, and she said, Yes, I am coming, but let me first offer a libation of water to my dead husband. And on this pretext she went into the water, and then she darted to the place where Kuwar had been bound and sank beneath the surface. The Raja bade men rescue her, but all were afraid to enter the water and she was seen no more. Then the Raja gave all the coolies a feast, and scattered money among the crowd, and dismissed them. And this is the end of the story. End of Kuwar and the Raja's Daughter This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Parganus Translated by Cecil Henry Bompus Part 1 18. The Laughing Fish Recorded by David Baker 18. The Laughing Fish there was once a merchant who prospered in his business, and in the course of time became very rich. He had five sons, but none of them was married. In the village where he lived was an old tank which was half silted up, and he resolved to clean it out and deepen it, if the Raja would give it to him. So he went to the Raja, and the Raja said that he could have the tank if he paid forty rupees. The birdship paid the money, and then went home and called his family together, and said that they would first improve the tank then find wives for all his sons. The sons agreed, and they collected coolies, and drained off the water, and began to dig out the silt. When they had drained off the water, they found in the bed of the tank a number of big fish of an unknown age, which they caught, and two of them they sent to the Raja as a present. When the fish were carried into the presence of the Raja, they both began to laugh. Then the Raja said, What is the meaning of this? Here are two dead fish. Why are they laughing? and he told the men who brought the fish to explain what was the matter, or else to take them away again. But they could give no explanation. Then the Raja called all his officers and astrologers, and asked them what they thought it meant, but no one could give him an answer. Then the Raja told the men to take the fish away again, and to tell the merchant that, if he could not explain why the fish laughed, he would kill him and all his descendants and he wrote a letter to the same effect, and fixed a day by which the merchant was to explain the matter. When the merchant read the letter, he fell into the greatest distress, and for two or three days he could not make up his mind whether to go on with the work on the tank or no, but in the end he resolved to finish it so that his name might be held in remembrance. So they finished the work, and then the merchant said to his sons, My sons, I cannot arrange for you marriages, for the Raja has threatened to kill us all if I cannot explain why the fish laughed. You must all escape from here, so that our family may not die out. 
But the younger sons all answered, We are not able to take care of ourselves. Either you come with us to protect us, or we will stay here. Then the merchant told his eldest son to escape alone, so that their family might not become extinct. So the eldest son took a supply of money and went away into a far country. After traveling a long time, he came to a town where a Raja lived and decided to stay there. So he first went to a tank and bathed and sat down on the bank to eat some refreshment. And as he sat, the daughter of the Raja came down to the tank to bathe, and she saw the merchant's son, and their eyes met. Then the princess sent her maidservants to ask him where he came from. And he told them from where he came from, and that he meant to make a stay in that town, and he promised them a rupee if they could persuade the princess to uncover her face. They went and told their mistress all this, and she answered, Go and get your rupee from him. I will uncover my face, and ask him what he wants. And when they went, she drew aside the cloth from her face. Then he gave them the rupee, and they asked him whether he had seen her and what his intention was. Then he said his wish was to marry the princess and live with her in her father's house. When the princess heard this, she said, Yes, my heart has gone out to him also. So then she bathed and went home and lay down in her room and would not get up, and when her father asked her what was the matter, she made no answer. Then they asked her maidens what was the matter, and they said that she had seen a stranger by the tank and wished to marry him. The Rani asked whether the stranger was still there, and they said that they had left him by the tank. So two men were sent to fetch the stranger, or to find out where he had gone. The two servants went and found the merchant's son just ready to continue his journey, and they asked him who he was and what he wanted. He said that he was looking for employment, but would like best to marry and live in the town of his father-in-law. Then they told him not to go away, and they would arrange such a marriage for him. So they took him to a house in town, and left him there, and went back to the Raja. They told the Raja that the stranger had gone away, but that they could follow him and bring him back if he gave them some money for their journey. So the Raja gave them two rupees. Then they went off, but only ate their dinner at home. And then they brought the merchant's son to the Raja, pretending that they had overtaken him a long way off. He was questioned about himself, and he told his whole history, except that the Raja had threatened to cut off his family. And his account being satisfactory, it was arranged that he should marry the princess. Musicians were sent for, and the marriage took place at once. After his marriage, the merchant's son was much depressed at the thought of his brother's fate, and in the middle of the night he used to rise up and weep till the bed was soaked with his tears. The princess noticed this, and one night she pretended to go to sleep, but really lay awake and watched her husband, and in the middle of the night she saw him rise quietly and begin to sob. She was filled with sympathy, and went to him and begged him to tell her what was the matter, and whether he was sorry that he had married her. And he answered, I cry because I am in despair. In the daytime I restrain my tears before others with difficulty, but in the night they cannot be kept back. But I am ashamed for you to see me, and I wait until you are asleep before I give way to my feelings. Then she asked what was the cause of his sorrow, and he answered, My father and mother and brothers and sisters are all doomed to die. For our Raja has sworn to kill them by a certain day, if he is not told why two fish, which my father sent to him as a present, laughed when they were brought before him. In consequence of this threat, my father sent me from home that one of the family might survive, and although I may be safe here, the thought of them and their fate makes me weep. The princess asked him what was the day fixed for the mystery to be explained, and he told her that it was the full moon of a certain month. Then the princess said, Come take me to your father's house. I shall be able to explain why the fishes laughed. The merchant's son joyfully agreed to start off the next day. So in the morning they told the Raja why they wished to go. And he said to his daughter, Go, and do not be afraid. Go in confidence. I promise you that you will be able to explain why the fishes laughed. So they made ready and journeyed to the merchant's house. And when they arrived, they told the merchant to go to the Raja and ask him to collect all the citizens on a certain day to hear the reason why the fishes laughed. The merchant went to the Raja, and the Raja gave him a letter fixing the day, and all the citizens were assembled in an open plain, and the princess dressed herself as a man and went to the assembly and stood before the Raja. Then the Raja bade her explain why the fishes laughed, and the princess answered, If you wish to know the reason, Order all your rainies to be brought here. So the rainies were summoned. Then the princess said, 
the reason why the fishes laughed was because among all your wives it is only the eldest Rainy who is a woman, and all the others are men. What will you give me if this is not proved to be true? Then the Raja wrote a bond promising to give the merchant half his kingdom if this were proved to be true. When inquiry was made, it was found that the wives had really become men, and that the Raja was put to shame before all his people. Then the assembly broke up, and the merchant received half the Raja's kingdom. End of 18. The Laughing Fish How the Cowherd Found a Bride This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santal Paganas Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas Part 1 19. How the Cowherd Found a Bride Recorded by Anna Simum there was once a goala who was in charge of a herd of cattle and every day he used to bring the herd for their midday rest to the foot of a peepul tree one day the peepul tree spoke and said to him if you pour milk every day at my roots i will grant you a boon so thenceforward the goala every day poured milk at the roots of the tree and after some days he saw a crack in the ground he thought that the roots of the tree were cracking the earth but the fact was that a snake was buried there and as it increased in size from drinking the milk, it cracked the ground, and one day it issued forth. At the sight of it the goala was filled with fear, and made sure that the snake would devour him. But the snake said, Do not fear. I was shut up in the nether world, and you by your kindness have rescued me. I wish to show gratitude to you, and will confer on you any boon for which you ask. The goala answered that the snake should choose what he would give him. Then the snake called him near and breathed on his hair, which was very long, and it became glistening as gold. And the snake said that his hair would obtain for him a wife, and that he would be very powerful, and that whatever he said would come to pass. The goala asked what sort of things would come to pass. The snake answered, If you say a man shall die, he will die, and if you say he shall come to life, he will come to life. But you must not tell this to anyone, not even to your wife when you marry. If you do, the power will vanish. Some time afterwards, it happened that the goala was bathing in the river, and as he bathed, one of his hairs came out, and the fancy took him to wrap it in a leaf and set it to float down the stream. Lower down the river, a princess was bathing with her attendants, and they saw the packet come floating down and tried to stop it, but it floated straight to the princess, and she caught it and opened it and found the hair inside. It shone like gold, and when they measured it, it was twelve fathoms long. So the princess tied it up in her cloth, and went home, and shut herself up in a room, and would neither eat, nor drink, nor speak. Her mother sent two of her companions to question her, and at last she told them that she would not rise and eat until they found the person to whom the golden hair belonged. If it were the hair of a man, he should be her husband, and if it came from a girl, she would have that girl come and live with her. When the Raja and Rani heard this, and that the hare had come floating down the river, they went to their daughter and told her that they would at once send messengers up the stream to find the owner of the hare. Then she was comforted, and rose up and ate her rice. That very day the Raja ordered messengers to follow up the banks of the stream, and inquire in all the villages, and question every one they met to find trace of the owner of the golden hare. So the messengers set out on both banks of the stream, and followed it to its source, but their search was vain, and they returned without news. Then holy mendicants were sent out to search, and they also returned unsuccessful. Then the princess said, If you cannot find the owner of the golden hair, I will hang myself. At this a tame crow and a parrot which were chained to a perch said, You will never be able to find the man with the golden hair. He is in the depths of the forest. If he had lived in a village you would have found him. But as it is, we alone can fetch him. Unfasten our chains, and we will go in search of him. So the Raja ordered them to be unfastened, and gave them a good meal before starting, for they could not carry a bag of provisions with them like a man. Then the crow and the parrot mounted into the air and flew away up the river, and after a long search they spied the goala in the jungle, resting his cattle under the peepul tree. So they flew down, and perched on the peepul tree, and consulted how they could lure him away. The parrot said that he was afraid to go near the cattle, and proposed that the crow should fly down and carry off the koala's flute, 
from where it was lying with his stick and wrapper at the foot of the tree. So the crow went flitting from one cow to another, till it suddenly pounced on the flute and carried it off in its beak. When the Goala saw this, he ran after the crow to recover his flute, and the crow tempted him on by just fluttering from tree to tree, and the Goala kept following. And when the crow was tired, the parrot took the flute from him, and so between them they drew the Goala on right to the Raja's city, and they flew into the palace, and the Goala followed them in and they flew to the room in which the princess was, and dropped the flute into the hand of the princess, and the Goala followed, and the door was shut upon him. The Goala asked the princess to give him the flute, and she said that she would give it to him if he promised to marry her, and not otherwise. He asked how he could marry her all of a sudden, when they had never been betrothed, but the princess said, "'We've been betrothed for a long time. Do you remember one day tying a hair up in a leaf?' and setting it to flow downstream? Well, that hair has been the go-between which arranged our betrothal. Then the Goala remembered how the snake had told him that his hair would find him a wife, and he asked to see the hair which the princess had found. So she brought it out, and they found that it was like his, as long and as bright. Then he said, We belong to each other. And the princess called for the door to be opened, and brought the Goala to her father and mother and told them that her heart's desire was fulfilled, and that if they did not allow the wedding to take place in the palace, she would run away with the goala. So a day was fixed for the wedding, and invitations were issued, and it duly took place. The goala soon became so much in love with his bride that he forgot all about his herd of cattle, which he had left behind, without any one to look after them. But after some time he bethought himself of them, and he told his bride that he must return to his cattle, whether she came with him or no. She said that she would take leave of her parents and go with him. Then the Raja gave them a farewell feast, and he made over to the Goala half his kingdom, and gave him a son's share of his elephants and horses and flocks and herds, and said to him, You are free to do as you like. You can stay here or go to your own home. But if you elect to stay here, I shall never turn you out. The Goala considered, and said that he would live with his father-in-law, but that he must anyhow go and see the cattle which he had abandoned without any one to look after them. So the next day he and his wife set off, and when they got to the jungle they found that all the cattle were lying dead. At this the goala was filled with grief and began to weep. Then he remembered the promise of the snake that he should be able to restore the dead to life, and he resolved to put it to the test. So he told his wife that he would give the dead cows medicine, and he got some jungle roots as a blind and held them, to the noses of the dead animals, and as he did so he said, Come to life. And behold, one by one, the cows all got up and began lowing to their calves. Having thus proved the promises of the snake, the goala was loud in his gratitude, and he filled a large vessel with milk and poured it all out at the foot of the peepul tree. And the snake came and breathed on the hair of the princess, and it too became bright as gold. The next day they collected all the cows and drove them back to the princess's home, and there the goala and his wife lived happily, ruling half the kingdom. And some years after the goala reflected that the snake was to him as his father and mother, and yet he had come away in a hurry without taking a proper farewell. So he went to see whether it was still there, but he could not find it, and he asked the people tree and no answer came. So he had to return home disappointed. End of How the Cowherd Found a Bride This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Central Paganas Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas Part 1 20. Kara and Guja. Recorded by Nicholas Illich. Once upon a time there were two brothers named Kara and Guja, who were first-class shots with the bow and arrow. In the country where they lived, a pair of kites were doing great damage. They had young ones in a nest in a tree, and used to carry off children to feed their nestlings until the whole country was desolated. So the whole population went in a body to the Raja and told him that they would have to leave the country if he could not have the kites killed. 
Then the Raja made proclamation that anyone who could kill the two kites should receive a large tract of land as a reward, and thereupon many men tried to kill them. But the kites had made their nest of plows and clod crushers so that the arrows could not hit them, and the shooters had to give up the attempt. At last, Kata and Guja thought they would try. So they made an ambush and waited till the birds came to the nest to feed their yard, and then shot them both through the hole in a clod crusher into which the pole fits, and the two kites fell down dead at the source of the Ganges and Jumna. And where they fell, they made a great depression in the ground. Then Kata and Guja carried the bodies to the Raja, and he gave them a grant of land. And the grateful neighbors made a large rice field of the depression which the kites had made in the earth, and this was given to Karanguja as service land to their great delight. Karanguja used to spend their time in the forest, living on what they could find there. They slept in a cave, and at evening would cook their rice there or roast jungle roots. One day a tiger spied them out as they were roasting tubers and came up to them suddenly and said, What are you cooking? Give me some or I will eat you. So, while they went on eating their roasted tubers, they threw the coals from the fire to the tiger at the mouth of the cave, and he crunched them up, and every now and then they threw him a bit of something good to eat. The tiger would not go away, but lay there expecting to be fed, and Kara and Guja debated how to get rid of him. Then Guja suddenly jumped up and dashed at the tiger and caught him by the tail, and began to twist the tail, and he went on twisting until it twisted right off and the tiger ran roaring away. Kara and Guja roasted the tail and ate it, and they found it so nice that they decided to hunt the tiger and eat the rest of him. So the two brothers searched for him everywhere, and when they found him, they chased him until they ran him down and killed him. Then they lit a fire and singed the hair off, and roasted the flesh and made a grand meal. But they did not eat the paunch. Kara wanted to eat it, but Guja would not let him. So Kara carried it away on his shoulder. Presently they sat down in the shade of a banyan tree by the side of a road, and along the road came a Raja's wedding procession. When Kara and Guja saw this, they climbed into the tree and took the tiger's paunch up with them. The wedding party came to a halt at the foot of the tree, and some of them lay down to eat. And the Raja got out of his palki and lay down to sleep in the shade. After a time, Kara got tired of holding the tiger's paunch in his arms and whispered to Guja that he could hold it no longer. Guja told him on no account to let it go, but at last Kara got so tired that he let it fall right on top of the Raja. Then all of the Raja's attendants raised a shout, and the Raja's stomach had burst, and all ran away in a panic, leaving everything they had under the tree. But after they had gone a little distance, they thought of the goods they had left behind, and how they could not continue the journey without them. So they made their way back to the banyan tree. But meanwhile... Kara and Guja had climbed down and gathered all the fine clothes and everything valuable and taken them up into the tree. And Kara took a large drum which he found, and in one end of the drum he made a number of little holes, and he caught a number of wild bees which had a nest in the tree, and put them one by one into the drum. When the Raja's attendants came back and saw that there were two men in the tree, they called out, Why have you dishonored our Raja? We will kill you. Kara and Guja answered, Come and see who will do the killing. So they began to fight, and the Raja's men fired their guns at Kara and Guja till they were tired of shooting, and had used up all their powder and shot, but they never hit them. Then Kara and Guja called out, Now it is our turn. And when the Raja's men saw that Kara and Guja had nothing but a drum, they said, Yes, it is your turn. So Kara and Guja beat the drum and called, At them, my dears! At them, my dears! And the wild bees flew out of the drum and stung all of the Raja's men and drove them right away. Then Kara and Guja took all their belongings and went home, and ever after were esteemed as great Rajas because of the wealth which they had acquired. End of Kara and Guja This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush, Marquette, Michigan, August 2006. Folklore of the Santal Parganus. Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas. 21. The Magic Cow. 
There was once a Raja who had an only son named Kara, and in the course of time the Raja fell into poverty and was little better than a beggar. One day, when Kara was old enough to work as a cowherd, his father called him and said, My son, I am now poor, but once I was rich. I had a fine estate and herds of cattle and fine clothes. Now that is all gone, and you have scarcely enough to eat. I am old and like to die, and before I leave you, I wish to give you this advice. There are many Rajas in the world. Raja above Raja. When I am dead, do you seek the protection of some powerful Raja. As there was not enough to eat at home, Kara had to take service as goat herd under a neighboring Raja. By which he earned his food and clothes and two rupees a year. Some time afterwards, his father died, and Kara went to his master and asked for a loan of money with which to perform his father's funeral ceremonies, and promised to continue in his service until he had worked off the loan. So the Raja advanced him five rupees and five rupees worth of rice, and with the money, Kara gave the funeral feast. Five or six days later, his mother died, and he again went to the Raja and asked for ten rupees more. At first the Raja refused, but Kara besought him and promised to serve him for his whole life if he could not repay the loan. So at last the Raja lent him ten rupees more, and he gave the funeral feast. But the Raja's seven sons were very angry with his father because he had lent twenty rupees to a man who had no chance of paying. And they used to threaten and worry Kara because he had taken the money. Then Kara remembered how his father had said that there were many Rajas in the world, Raja above Raja, and he resolved to run away and seek service with the greatest Raja in the world. So he ran away, and after traveling some distance, he met a Raja being carried in a palki and going with a large party to fetch a bride for his son. And when he heard who it was, he decided to follow the Raja. So he went along behind the palki, and at one place a she jackal ran across the road. Then the Raja got out of his palki and made a salam to the jackal. When Kara saw this, he thought, This cannot be the greatest Raja in the world, or why should he be salam to the jackal? The jackal must be more powerful than the Raja. I will follow the jackal. So he left the wedding party and went after the jackal. Now the jackal was hunting for food for her young ones, and as Kara followed her wherever she went, she could find no opportunity of killing goat or sheep. So at last she went back to the cave in which she lived. Then her cubs came whining to meet her, and she told her husband that she had been able to catch nothing that day because a man had followed her wherever she went, and had come right up to their cave and was waiting outside. Then the he jackal told her to ask what the man wanted. So she went out to Kara and asked him, and Kara said, I have come to place myself under your protection. Then she called the he jackal, and they said to him, We are jackals, and you are a man. How can you stay with us? What could we give you to eat, and what work could we find for you to do? Kara said that he would not leave them as all his hopes lay in them. And at last the jackals took pity on him and consulted together, and agreed to give him a gift. As he had come to them so full of hope. So they gave him a cow which was in the cave, and said to him, As you have believed in us, we have made up our minds to benefit you. Take this cow, she will supply you with everything you want. If you address her as mother, she will give you whatever you ask. But do not ask her before people, for they would take her from you. And do not give her away, whatever inducements are offered you. Then Kara thanked them and called down blessings on their heads, and took the cow and led it away homewards. When he came to a tank, he thought he would bathe and eat. While he bathed, he saw a woman washing clothes at the other side of the tank, but he thought that she would not notice him. So he went up to the cow and said, Mother, give me a change of clothes. Thereupon the cow vomited up some nice new clothes, and he put them on and looked very fine. Then he asked the cow for some plates and dishes, and she gave them. Then he asked for some bread and some dried rice, 
and he ate all he wanted, and then asked the cow to keep the plates and dishes for him, and the cow swallowed them up again. Now the woman by the tank had seen all that had happened, and ran home and told her husband what she had seen, and begged him to get hold of the wonderful cow by some means or other. Her husband could not believe her, but agreed to put it to the test. So they both went to Kara and asked where he was going, and offered to give him supper, and put him up for the night, and give grass for his cow. He accepted this invitation, and went with them to their house, and they gave him the guest-room to sleep in, and asked what he would have to eat. But he said that he did not want any supper, for he intended to get a meal from the cow after everyone was asleep. Then the man and his wife made a plot, and pretended to have a violent quarrel, and after abusing each other for some time, the man flung out of the house in a passion, and pretended to run away. But after going a short distance, he crept back quietly to the guest-room. Hanging from the roof was the body of a cart, and he climbed up into that and hid himself, without Kara knowing anything about it. When Kara thought everyone was asleep, he asked his cow for some food, and having made a good meal, went to sleep. The man watching up above saw everything, and found that his wife had spoken the truth. So in the middle of the night he climbed down and led away Kara's magic cow, and put in its place one of his own cows of the same color. Early the next morning Kara got up and unfastened the cow and began to lead it away. But the cow would not follow him. Then he saw that it had been changed, and he called his host, and charged him with the theft. The man denied it, and told him to call any villagers who had seen him bring his cow the day before. Now no one had seen him come, but Kara insisted that the cow had been changed, and went to summon the village headman and the villagers to decide the matter. But the thief managed to give a bribe of one hundred rupees to the headman, and one hundred rupees to the villagers, and made them promise to decide in his favor. So when they met together, they told Kara that he must take the cow, which he had found tied up in the morning. Kara protested, and said that he would fetch the person from whom he had got the cow, and take whichever cow he pointed out, telling them that they were responsible for his cow while he was away. He hastened off to the cave where the jackals lived. The jackals somehow knew that he had been swindled out of the cow, and they met him saying, "'Well, man, have you lost your cow?' and he answered that he had come to fetch them to judge between himself and the villagers. So the jackals went with him, and he went straight to the headmen, and told them to collect all the villagers. Meanwhile the jackals spread a mat under a peepal tree, and sat on it chewing pan. And when the villagers had assembled, the jackal began to speak, and said, "'If a judge takes a bribe, his descendants for several generations shall eat filth, in this world and the next. But if he make public confession, then he shall escape this punishment. This is what our forefathers have said, and the man who defrauds another shall be thrust down into hell. This also they have said. Now all of you make honest enquiry into this matter. We will swear before God to do justice, and the complainant and the accused shall also take oath, and we will decide fairly. Then the village headman was conscience-stricken, and admitted that he had taken a bribe of one hundred rupees and the villagers also confessed that they had been bribed. Then the jackal asked the accused what he had to say to this, but he persisted that he had not changed the cow. The jackal asked him what penalty he would pay if he were proved guilty, and he said that he would pay double. Then the jackal called the villagers to witness that the man had fixed his punishment, and he proposed that he and his wife should go to the herd of cattle, and if they could pick out the cow that Kara claimed, it would be sure proof that it was his. So the jackals went, and at once picked out the cow, and the villagers were astonished, and cried, This is a just judgment! They have come from a distance, and have recognized the cow at once. The man who had stolen it had no answer to give. Then the jackal said, You yourself promised to pay double. You gave a bribe of one hundred rupees to the headman, and one hundred rupees to the villagers and the cow you stole is worth two hundred rupees. That is four hundred rupees. Therefore you must pay a fine of eight hundred rupees. And the man was made to produce eight hundred rupees, and the jackal gave all the money to the villagers, except ten rupees which he gave to Kara, and he kept nothing for himself. 
Then Kara and the jackals went away with the cow, and after getting outside the village, the jackals again warned Kara not to ask the cow for anything when anyone was by, and took their leave of him and went home. Kara continued his journey, and at evening arrived at a large mango orchard, in which a number of carters were camping for the night. So Kara stopped under a tree at a little distance from the carters, and tied his cow to the root. Soon a storm came up, and the carters all took shelter underneath their carts, and Kara asked his cow for a tent, and he and the cow took shelter in it. It rained hard all night, and in the morning the carters saw the tent, and wondered where it came from, and came to the conclusion that the cow must have produced it. So they resolved to steal the cow. Kara did not dare to make the cow swallow the tent in the daytime, while the carters were about, so he stayed there all the next day, and at night the cow put away the tent. Then, when Kara was asleep, some carters came and took away the cow, and put in its place a cow with a calf, and they hid the magic cow within a wall of packs from their pack bullocks. In the morning, Kara at once saw what had happened, and went to the carters and charged them with the theft. They denied all knowledge of the matter, and told him he might look for his cow if he liked. So he searched the encampment, but could not see it. Then he called the village headman and Chowkidar, and they searched and could not find the cow, and they advised Kara to keep the cow and calf, as it must be better than his own barren cow. But he refused, and said that he would complain to the magistrate, and he made the headman promise not to let the carters go until he came back. So he went to a Mohammedan magistrate, and it chanced that he was an honest man who gave just judgments and took no bribes, and made no distinction between the rich and the poor. He always listened to both sides carefully, not like some rascally magistrates who always believe the story that is first told them and pay no attention to what the other sides say. So when Kara made his complaint, this magistrate at once sent for the carters, and the carters swore that they had not stolen the cow. And offered to forfeit all the property they had with them if the cow was found in their possession. When the magistrate sent police to search the encampment, and the police pulled down the pile of packs that had been round the cow, and found the cow inside and took it to the magistrate. Then the magistrate ordered the carters to fulfill their promise, and put them all in prison and gave all their property to Kara. So Kara loaded all the merchandise on the carts and pack bullocks and went home rejoicing. At first, the villagers did not recognize who it was who had come with so much wealth. But Kara made himself known to them, and they were very astonished and helped him to build a grand house. Then Kara went to the Raja from whom he had borrowed the money for his parents' funeral and paid back what he owed. The Raja was so pleased with him that he gave him his daughter in marriage, and afterwards Kara claimed his father in law's kingdom and got possession of it and lived prosperously ever after. And the seven sons of his first master, who used to scold him, were excited by his success, and thought that if they went to foreign parts, they also would gain great wealth. So they took some money from their father and went off. But all they did was to squander their capital, and in the end, they had to come back penniless to their father. End of the Magic Cow This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Folklore of the Suntal Pergunas. Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas. Part 1. 22. Lita and His Animals. Once upon a time, there was a man who had four sons. Two of them were married, and two were unmarried, and the youngest was named Lita. One day, Lita went to his father, and asked for fifty or sixty rupees, that he might go on a trading expedition, and he promised that if he lost the money, he would not ask for any share in the paternal property. As he was very urgent, his father at last gave him sixty rupees, and he set out on his travels. After going some way, he came to a village in which all the inhabitants were chasing a cat. He asked them what was the matter, and they told him that the cat was always stealing their rajah's milk, 
and the Raja had offered a reward of twenty rupees to anyone who would kill it. Then Lita said to them, Do not kill the cat, catch it alive and give it to me, and I will pay you twenty rupees for it. Then you can go to the Raja and say that you have killed it and ask for the reward. And if the Raja asks to see the body, tell him that a stranger came and asked for the body, for he thought that a cat which had fed on milk should be good eating, and so you gave it to him. The villagers thought that this would be an excellent plan, and promised to bring him the cat alive. They soon managed to catch it, hiding under a heap of firewood, and brought it to Lita, and he paid them twenty rupees, and then they went to the Raja and got twenty rupees from him. Then Lita went on, and by and by came to a village, where the villagers were hunting an otter in a tank. They had made a cut in the tank, and had let out all the water. Lita went to them and asked what they were doing. They said that they were hunting for an otter which had been destroying the Raja's fish, and the Raja had promised them a reward if they killed it. And they had driven it into the tank and were draining off the water in order to catch it. Then Lita offered to buy it of them if they brought it to him alive. So when they caught it, they brought it to him, and he gave them money for it and continued his journey with the cat and the otter. Presently he saw a crowd of men, and he went up to them and asked what they were doing. And they told him that they were hunting a rat, which was always gnawing the Raja's pens and papers, and the Raja had offered a reward for it, and they had driven it out of the palace, but it had taken refuge in a hole, and they were going to dig it out. Then Lita offered to buy it from them, as he had bought the other two animals, and they dug it out and sold it to him. He went on, and in the same way found a crowd of men hunting a snake, which had bitten many people, and he offered to buy it for twenty rupees, and when they had chased it till it was exhausted, they caught it alive and sold it to Lita. As his money was all spent, he then set off homewards, and on the way the snake began to speak, and said, Lita, you have saved my life. Had you not come by, those men would certainly have had my life. Come with me to my home, where my father and mother are, and I will give you anything you ask for. We have great possessions. But Lita was afraid, and said, When you get there you will eat me, or if you don't, your father and mother will. But the snake protested that it could not be guilty of such ingratitude, and at last Lita agreed to accompany it when it had left the other animals at his home. This he did, and set off alone with the snake and after some days they reached the snake's home. The snake told Lita to wait outside while he went and apprised his parents, and he told Lita that when he was asked to choose his reward, he should name nothing but the ring which was on the father snake's finger. For the ring had this property, that if it was placed in a seer of milk, and then asked to produce anything whatever, that thing would immediately appear. Then the snake went on to his home, and when the father and mother saw him, they fell on his neck and kissed him, and wept over him, saying that they had never expected to see him again. The snake told them how he had gone to the country of men, and how a reward had been set on his head, and that he had been hunted, and how Lita had bought him from the men who would have killed him. The father snake asked why he had not brought Lita to be rewarded, and the snake said that he was afraid that when they saw him they would eat him but the father and mother swore that they could never be guilty of such ingratitude, and when he heard this, the snake went and brought in Lita, and they entertained him handsomely for two days, and on the third day the father snake asked Lita what he would take as his reward. Lita looked round at the shining palace in which they lived, and at first was afraid to speak, but at last he said, I do not want money or anything but the ring on your finger. If you will not give me that, I will take nothing. I saved your son from peril, and that you will remember all your lives. And if you give me the ring, I will honor you for it as long as I live. Then the father and mother snake consulted together, and the mother said, Give it to him as he asks for it. So the father snake drew it from his finger and gave it to Lita, and they gave him also some money for his journey back. And he went home and found the other three animals, safe and sound, waiting for him. After a time, his father said that Lita must marry. So marriage go-betweens were sent out to look for a bride, and they found a very rich and beautiful girl whose parents were agreeable to the match. 
but the girl herself said that she would only marry a man who would build the covered passage from her house to his, so that she could walk to her new home in the shade. The go-betweens reported this, and Lita's fathers and brothers consulted, and agreed that they could never make such a passage. But Lita said to his father, Arrange the match. It shall be my charge to arrange for making the covered passage. I will not let you be put to shame over it. For Lita had already put the ring to the test. He had dropped it into a sear of milk, and said, Let five barias of parched rice and two barias of curds appear and immediately the parched rice and curds were before him. And thereupon he had called out, The snake has worthily rewarded me for saving his life. And the cat and the otter and the rat overheard what he said. So the go-between was told to arrange for the wedding to take place that very month, as Lita's birthday fell in the next month, which therefore was not suitable for his wedding. Then the bride's family sent him back to say that they were prepared to send a string of nine knots. And the next day the go-between told this to Lita's family, and they said that they were willing to accept it. So the go-between brought a string of nine knots to signify that the wedding would take place in nine days. The days passed, and Lita's father and brothers became very anxious because they saw no sign of the covered passage. But on the very night before the wedding, Lita took his ring and ordered a covered passage to be made from one house to the other, with a good path down the middle. And the next morning they found it made, and the bridegroom's party passed along it to the bride's house, and the bride was escorted home along it. Now the bride had been deeply in love with another young man, who lived in her village and had much wished to marry him, but her wishes, of course, were not consulted in the matter. Some time after the marriage, she one day, in the course of conversation, asked her husband Lita how much he had spent on making the covered passage to her house, and how he had built it so quickly. He told her that he knew nothing about it, that his father and mother had arranged for it, and no doubt had spent a large sum of money. So the next day, she took an opportunity of asking her mother-in-law about it, but Lita's mother said that nothing had been spent at all. Somehow the passage had been made in one night, she knew not how. Then Lita's wife saw that Lita was keeping a secret from her, and she began to reproach him for having any secrets from his wife. And at last, when she had faithfully promised never to reveal the matter to anyone, he told her the secret of the ring. Now her former lover used still to visit her, and one day she sent for him, and said that she would no longer live with Lita, but wished to run away with him. The lover at first objected that they would be pursued and killed, while if they escaped to a distance, he would have nothing to support her with. But the faithless woman said that there need be no anxiety about that, and she told him about the magic ring, and how, by means of it, they could provide themselves with a house and everything they wanted. So they fixed a night for the elopement, and on that night, when Lita was asleep, his wife quietly drew the ring off his finger, and went out to her lover who was waiting outside, and told him to get a goat from the pen. Then they beheaded the goat, and went inside and poured all its blood on the ground, under the bed on which Lita was sleeping, and then, having hid the body and head of the goat, they ran away. Towards morning, Lita woke up and missed his wife, so he lit a lamp to look for her, and then saw the pool of blood under the bed. At this sight he was terror-stricken. Some enemy had killed and carried off his wife, and he would be charged with the murder. So he lay there, wondering what would happen to him. At last his mother came into the room, to see why he and his wife had not got up as usual, and when she saw the blood she raised a cry. The village headmen and Chokadar were sent for, and they questioned Lita, but he could only say that he knew nothing of what had happened. He did not know what the blood was, he did not know where his wife was. Thereupon they sent two men to the house of the wife's parents, to see if by any chance she had run away there, and, in any case, to bring her relations to be present at the inquiry into her disappearance. When her father and brothers heard what had happened, they at once went to Lita's house in wrath, and abused him as a murderer. They asked why, if his wife had not done her duty to him, he had not sent her back to them to be chastised and taught better, instead of murdering her, and they went straight to the magistrate and complained. The magistrate sent police, who arrested Lita, and took him before the magistrate. 
Meanwhile, it had become known that not only was Lita's wife missing, but also her lover, and Lita's father presented a petition to the magistrate, bringing this to notice and asserting that the two must have run away together. Then the magistrate ordered every search to be made for the missing couple, but said that Lita must remain in custody till they were found, so he was shut up in prison. From prison, he made an application to the magistrate that his three tame animals, the cat and the otter and the rat, might be brought to the place where he was. The magistrate kindly consented, but the animals were not allowed into the prison. However, at night, the rat, being small, made its way inside and found Lita, and asked what was to be done. Lita said that he wanted the three animals to save him from his great danger as he had saved them. He wanted them to trace his wife and her lover, and recover the ring. They would doubtless find them living in some gorgeous palace, the gift of the ring. The rat went out, and gave the other two Lita's message, and they readily undertook to do their best. So the next morning the three animals set off. In vain they hunted all over the country, till one day they came to the bank of the Ganges, and there on the other side they saw a palace shining like gold. At this their hopes revived, for this might be a palace made by the magic ring. But the cat and the rat objected that they could not cross the river. The otter said that he would easily manage that, and he took the cat on his back, and the rat climbed on the back of the cat, and so the otter ferried them both across the river. Then they consulted, and decided that it would be safest to wait till the evening before they went to the palace to see who lived in it. When they looked in in the evening, they at once recognized Lita's wife and her lover. But these two were in constant terror of being pursued, and when they had their evening meal, they fastened and bolted every entrance so securely that no one could gain admittance. Then the cat and the otter told the rat that he must collect all the rats of the neighborhood, and they must burrow through the wall and find some way of abstracting the magic ring. So the rat collected a crowd of his friends, and in no time they bored a hole through the wall. Then they all began to look for the ring. They hunted high and low, but could not find it. However, the cat sat at the entrance of the hole which they had made, and vowed that they should not come out unless they got the ring. Then the first rat climbed onto the bed in which the couple were sleeping, and searched their clothes and examined their fingers and toes, but in vain. Then he thought that the woman might have it in her mouth, so he climbed onto her chest and tickled her nose with the tip of his tail. This made her sneeze, and behold, she sneezed out the ring which she had hidden in her mouth. The rat seized it and ran off with it, and when the cat was satisfied that he had really got it, she let him out, and the three friends set off rejoicing on their homeward journey. They crossed the river in the same way as when they came with the cat riding on the otter and the rat on the cat, and the rat held the ring in its own mouth. Unfortunately, when they were halfway across, a kite swooped down to try and carry off the rat. Twice it swooped and missed its grasp, but the second time it struck the rat with its wing, and the rat, in terror, let the ring fall into the river. When they reached the bank, the three friends consulted what they were to do in this fresh misfortune. As the otter was the only one who could swim, it volunteered to look for the ring, so it plunged into the water and searched the bottom of the river, in vain. Then it guessed that a fish must have swallowed the ring, and it set to work to catch every fish it saw and tore them open. At last, in the stomach of a big fish, it found the ring, and so it brought the fish to the bank, and while they were all rejoicing and eating a little of the fish, a kite swooped down and carried off the fish, ring and all. The three animals watched the kite flying away with the fish, but some women who were gathering firewood ran after the kite and took the fish from it, and putting it in their basket went home. Then the otter and the rat said to the cat, Now it is your turn. We have both recovered the ring once, but we cannot go into the house of these humans. They will let you go near them easily enough. The ring is in the fish's stomach. You must watch whether they throw away the stomach or clean it, and find an opportunity for carrying off the ring." So the cat ran after the women, and when they began to cut up the fish, it kept meowing round them. They threw one or two scraps to it, but it only sniffed at them and would not eat them. Then they began to wonder what on earth the cat wanted, and at last they threw the stomach to it. 
This it seized on gladly, and carried it off and tore it open, and found the ring, and ran off with it to where the otter and the rat were waiting. Then the three friends traveled hard for a day and a night, and reached the prison in which Leda was confined. When Leda got the ring, he begged the jailer to get him a seer of milk, and when it was brought he dropped the ring in it, and said, I wish the bed on which my faithless wife and her lover are sleeping to be brought here with them in it this very night, and before morning the bed was brought to the prison. Then the magistrate was called, and when he saw that the wife was alive he released Lita, and the lover who had ran away with her had to pay Lita double the expenditure which had been incurred on his marriage, and was fined beside. But Lita married another wife, and lived happily with her and some time afterwards he called the otter and the cat and the rat to him, and said that he purposed to let them go, and before they parted he would give them anything they wished for. They said that he owed them nothing, and they made Lita promise to let them know if he ever lost the ring or fell into trouble, and he promised to help them if ever their lives were in danger, and one morning he took them to a bazaar, near which was a tank full of fish, and he turned the otter into the tank, and left the cat and the rat to support themselves in the bazaar. The next day he went to see them, and the otter came out of the tank and gave him a fish which it had caught, and the cat brought him some milk it had stolen, and that was the last he saw of them. End of Lita and His Animals This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore of the Santel Parganas Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas Part 1 XXIII The Boy Who Found His Father Recorded by Frank Farage There was once a boy who used always to cheat when playing kati, pitch and toss, and for this the village boys with whom he played used to quarrel with him, saying, Fatherless orphan, why do you cheat? So one day he asked his mother why they called him that name and whether his father was really dead. He is alive, said she, but a long time ago a rhinoceros carried him off on its horn. Then the boy vowed that he would go in search of his father, and made his mother put him up provisions for the journey. And he started off taking with him an iron bow and a big bundle of arrows. He journeyed on all day, and at nightfall he came to a village. There he went up to the house of an old woman to ask for a bed. He stood at the threshold and called out to her, Granny, Granny, open the door! I have no son, and no grandchildren to call me Granny, grumbled the old woman, and went to open the door to see who was there. And when she opened the door and saw him, she said, Ho, oh, you are my grandson. Yes, answered he, I am your grandchild. So she called him inside and gave him a bed to sleep on. The old woman was called Huti Budi, and she and the boy sat up late talking together and then they lay down to sleep. But in the middle of the night, he heard the old woman crunching away, trying to bite his bow to pieces. He asked her what she was eating. Some pulse I got from the village headman. Give me a little to try, he begged. I am sorry, my child, I have finished it all. But really she had none to give. However, she only heard her jaws biting, so that she began to groan with pain. "'What are you groaning for, Granny?' said the boy. "'Because I have a toothache,' she answered. And in truth, her cheeks were badly swollen. Then he told her that a good cure for toothache was to bite on a white stone. And she believed him, and the next morning got a piece of white quartz and began to bite on it. But this only broke her teeth and made her mouth bleed, so that the pain was worse than before. Then the boy jeered at her and said, Did you think, Granny, that you could bite my iron bow and arrows? So saying, he left her, 
and continued the search for his father, and his road led him to a dense jungle which seemed to have no end. And in the middle of the jungle he came to a lake, and he sat down by it to eat what was left of the provisions he had brought. As he sat, he suddenly saw some cow bison coming down to the lake. At this he caught up his bow and arrows in a hurry, and climbed up a tall sal tree. From the tree he watched the bison go down to the water to drink, and then go back into the jungle. And after them, tigers and bears came down to the water. The sight of them frightened him, and he sang, Drink your fill, tiger. I shall not shoot you. I shall shoot the giant rhinoceros. And they drank and went away. Then various kinds of birds came, and after them a great herd of rhinoceroses, and among them was one which had the dried-up body of the boy's father stuck on its horn. The boy was rather frightened, and sang, Drink your fill, rhinoceroses, I shall not shoot you, I shall shoot the giant rhinoceros. And when the giant rhinoceros with the body of his father stooped its head to drink from the lake, he put an arrow through it, and it turned a somersault and fell over dead while all the other rhinoceroses turned tail and ran away. Then the boy climbed down from the tree and pulled the dead body of his father off the horn of the dead animal and laid it down at the foot of a tree and began to weep over it. As he wept, a man suddenly stood before him and asked what was the matter, and when he heard, said, Cry no more, take a cloth and wet it in the lake, and cover your father's body with it and then whip the body with a mirror twig, and he will come to life. So saying, the stranger suddenly disappeared, and the boy obeyed his instructions, and behold, his father sat up alive and rubbing his eyes, said, I must have been asleep a very long time. Then his son explained to him all that had happened, and gave him some food, and took him home. End of XXIII the Boy Who Found His Father. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Folklore of the Suntal Perganas. Translated by Cecil Henry Bompas. Part 1. 24. The Oil Man's Bullock. There was once a poor but industrious oil man. He got a log of wood and carved out an oil mill, and, borrowing some money as capital, he bought mustard and sesame seed and set to work to press it. As he had no bullock, he had to turn the mill himself. He was so industrious that he soon began to prosper and was able to buy a bullock for his mill. By and by he got so rich that he was able to buy some land and a cart and pair of bullocks, and was quite a considerable man in the village. One day one of his cart bullocks died, and this loss was a sad blow to the oil man. However, he tied up the surviving bullock in the stable, along with the old oil mill bullock, and fed them well. One night it chanced that one of the villagers passed by the stable, and heard the two animals talking, and this is what he heard. The young bullock said, you came to this house first, friend. What sort of treatment does one get here? Why do you ask me? said the other. Oh, I see your shoulder is galled, and your neck shows mark of the yoke. The old bullock answered, Whether my master treats me well or ill, I owe him money, and have to stay here until I have paid him off. When I have paid him five hundred rupees, I shall go. How will you ever pay back such a sum? If my master would only match me to fight the Rajah's elephant for five hundred rupees, I should win the fight and my debt would be cleared, and if he does not do that, I shall probably have to work for him all my life. How long do you intend to stay? My debt will be cleared if I work for him for two years, answered the newcomer. The man who overheard this conversation was much astonished, and went off to the oil man and told him all about it. Next day the whole village had heard of it, and they were all anxious for the oil man to match his bullock against the rajah's elephant. But the oil man was very frightened, for he feared that if he sent such a challenge, the rajah would be angry with him and drive him out of the country. 
but the leading villagers urged him, and undertook to find the money if he lost, and to persuade the Raja that the oil man was mad, if he became angry with him. At last the oil man consented, provided that some of the villagers went to the Raja and proposed the match. He was too frightened to go himself. So two of the village elders went to the Raja and asked him to match his elephant against the oil man's bullock for five hundred rupees. The Raja was very much amused, and at once fixed a day for the fight. So they returned and told the oil man to be ready, and raised a subscription of five hundred rupees. The evening before the contest, the oil man gave the bullock a big feed of meal and oil cake, and on the eventful morning the villagers all collected and watched him oiling its horns and tying a bell round its neck. Then the oil man gave the bullock a slap on its back and said, Take care, you are going to fight an elephant. If you owe me so much money you will win, and if not, then you will be defeated. When he said this, the bullock pawed the ground and snorted and put down its head. Then they all set out with the five hundred rupees to a level field near the Rajah's palace. A great crowd collected to see the fun, and the Rajah went there expecting easily to win five hundred rupees. The elephant was brought forward, with vermilion on its cheeks, and a pad on its back, and a big bell round its neck, and a mahout riding it. The crowd called out, Put down the stakes! So each side produced the money, and publicly announced that the owner of the animal which should be victorious should take all the stakes. But the oil man objected to the mahouts riding the elephant. No one was going to ride his bullock. This was seen to be fair, and the mahout had to get off. Then the fight began. The bullock snorted and blew through its nose, and ran at the elephant with its head lowered. Then the elephant also rushed forward, but the bullock stood its ground and stamped. At this the elephant turned tail and ran away. The bullock ran after it and gored it from behind until it trumpeted with pain. The crowd shouted, The Rajah's elephant is beaten. And the oil man took the five hundred rupees and they all went home. From that day the oil man no longer put the bullock to work the oil mill, but fed it well and left it free to go where it liked. But the bullock only stayed on with him for one month and then died. End of The Oil Man's Bullock End of LibriVox, Volume 1 of Folklore of the Suntal Perganas